Bill 64, and I call Representative Gallagher. So hello again, um, just for the record, uh, I'm Representative Eric Gallagher from Concord Ward 6, uh, which is Merrimack County District 20. I am here to introduce House Bill 64, an act requiring the Commission on Demographic Trends to consider data on race and ethnicity for the purpose of increasing racial and ethnic diversity in New Hampshire. So, um, yeah, my way of introducing this is going to be a little bit roundabout, but bear with me. So, um, yeah, I was born here in Concord, grew up in Concord, and one of the things I've really loved about living in New Hampshire is our first in the nation primary. Um, at our high school, uh, we had a teacher, Joanne McGlynn, who would had the, ran this presidential candidates club where um, we would organize events where the different presidential candidates from both parties would come and speak at um, the high school. And that was really a formative experience for me. Um, politically and part of the reason why I'm here today. Um, and so you, you may remember, for example, John McCain calling me a little jerk during one of his events. I um, wrote my college application essay on that, defending his right to call me one because I was being a little jerk. But um, yeah, so, and that got me into George Washington University. So, but now that I've returned to New Hampshire, one thing that's changed is that um, our first in the nation primary is under attack. And one of the common arguments that is used against us having the first in the nation primary is that we are not diverse enough, um, that we do not have a set of demographics that are representative of those of the nation at large. The thing is, when people bring up that point, I don't really have a good comeback to it. Like, you know, they're right. I I I agree with them that um that the state with the first in the nation primary should have demographics that are representative of those of the at, at the nation at large. Where I diverge from the other people making this argument, though is that instead of then giving up and saying, okay, so therefore New, Sh New Hampshire should no longer go first, I instead conclude, well, then therefore New Hampshire should become that state with the representative demographics of the nation that uh, deserves to go first. Um, so yeah, I spent some time thinking about how to do that, um, I first considered a study committee, but then thought instead of um, trying some, instead of creating something new, that it would be better to um, just do something with a body that already exists. So at first, um, at first I was going to, um, so the governor has established his, or well, had established, I don't know if it still exists, um, his own personal um, diversity, equity, and inclusion council. Um, so I was thinking of possibly get, um, creating a statutory basis for that. Um, but um, that, that would have been more difficult than, um, 
than I had the appetite to pursue at the time. So instead, I discovered that we have a commission on demographic trends already, which kind of already deals with the um, topic of demographics. So um, I just looked at the statute establishing it and decided to add a sentence to it, um, just adding to their duties of the um, advice that they provide. Um, so I actually filed this bill last year too, but due to a scheduling mishap, um, I did not I, I, I did not um, introduce it, um, which led to it being killed. And one of the reasons it died apparently was because the Commission on Demographic Trends had been eliminated in the state budget. So it was trying to amend a statute that didn't exist. Well, later that term, we passed another bill to reestablish the Commission on Demographic Trends. So now it exists again. So now the statute, the, the statute that we're modifying should actually exist this time around. So it should actually work. Um, so just um, to address some points about it that might come up. Um, so it's worded neutrally. It doesn't mention any specific race or ethnicity. Um, if somehow we were to, if, if our racial and ethnic makeup somehow were inverted, it would, the increasing diversity would mean moving in the other di direction. Um, so, um, so the, all, all of the things that um, the commission does are advisory. Um, so if, if people decide that they don't like the commission's advice, they're free to ignore it, although I don't think that they should because I, um, I think they generally give good advice. Um, so yeah, it's just, um, it, it, it's a commission that already meets. Um, they, um, so, and for, for disclosure's sake, um, my father actually sits on this commission, but he doesn't gain anything from this legislation though, besides extra work. So I, I don't really think that makes it a conflict of um, interest or anything. Um, so yeah, um, it's a good commission that, um, and I think passing this bill would just help us to signal to the rest of the country that we take their critiques of our lack of diversity seriously and are attempting to do something about it. Um, now, you could argue the DNC's already voted to take away our primary from us, but personally, I'm not ready to give up that quickly. I think it's still worthwhile making the best possible case that we can um, you know, because the, the, it's, it's going to go further. The Secretary of State is required to schedule our primary first. So he's going to do that. And then the next debate will be whether the DNC takes our delegates away or not. And I think, um, I think it would be helpful in the debate over whether our delegates get taken away or not to be able to refute the point about us not liking diversity here. Um, so, yeah, um, th this this bill was something I came up with on my own. It wasn't something that they asked for specifically. So I, I don't think this should be seen as caving to their demands or anything. I think it should just be um, seen as um, taking points that have been made seriously and attempting to do something about them. Um, so that is my testimony on this bill and I will take questions now. Thank you, Representative Gallagher. Are there questions? Representative O'Brien? 
Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Representative Gallagher, for taking my question. And just briefly looking at this and listening to some of your comments, uh, you are talking, and I have a keen interest in it, too, in the primary. And, you know, I, I'm very proud being a New Hampshire person to have the first in the nation primary and would like to keep such. But let's focus on the bill at hand right before us. And I'm looking at it, and in the titleage of the original bill, it's you're basically repeating what is in the titleage. So my down-home, right-to-the-bullseye type of question, what do you see is the real need of change here, what this, that the commission isn't always doing? And going by your initial remarks, which... What is in your first sentence is what it should be doing anyways. Aren't we already doing it is the question. Um, so, well, all right. So there's two parts to that there uh, that I'm going to address separately. One is the title. I do agree that the title is rather long and basically just says the same um, text as the bill itself. Um, yeah, OLS created that title and I would be open to an amendment to shorten it um, as long as it retains the same basic um, meaning of it. Um, and as for, um, yeah, the part about my remarks not actually being reflected in the bill. So yeah, um, my initial draft of it um, did include language specifically mentioning the first in the nation primary, but that just um, didn't didn't make it into the final draft. O OLS didn't think it was necessary. So you can put that back if you think it's necessary. Um, and then, so as far as um, what the um, commission is already doing, so they're actually, when the, the de demographics they're mostly looking at currently have to do with age. They're mostly looking at um, back in back in 2018. You heard a lot more about this, um, about our silver tsunami of um, our aging population of not having enough young people to take care of our older residents. So that's primarily what they're looking at currently. Um, and yeah, I think just having a little bit of um, extra specificity could just help nudge things in the right direction here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Representative Dolan. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Gallagher. Uh, we have over 400 commissions in the state right now where, where a good portion of them never meet. And uh, there is a move afoot to try to trim that down and eliminate them, make government much more efficient. This, I can tell you, this is this one is a candidate to be eliminated. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Um, yes, I have. Um, I have seen the schedule and seen how there is a bill to um, eliminate the commission entirely scheduled immediately after this one. Um, yeah. Uh, I will try to limit my remarks to the bill at hand now, um, and I'm going. I am going to be uh, sticking around longer. So um, yeah, I do plan to testify on the next bill too. But um, as far as whether this commission, uh, as far as this commission, it, this this is not one of the commissions that doesn't ever meet. It does actually meet. Um, I think it's monthly. If it's not monthly, it's bi-monthly. Um, but yeah, there's there's members of both parties um, on it. I think Senator Hennessy um, was the person running it previously. Um, so yeah, I I think that um, it is a commission worth keeping around. Representative Abair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for testifying today. And I'm just curious on the reason for doing this 
is that the goal is to increase New Hampshire's ethnic diversity, according to the testimony we've received today. How would, how by collecting data, are you going to increase New Hampshire's ethnic diversity? And once the state has data like this, what do you think that the state can do with this beyond this? There's there's obviously a goal beyond this based on what I'm reading here. Thank you. Yeah. So, well, the thing, yeah, we do, in fact, have some existing pockets of diversity um, in our state currently, like um, in Concord, it's more out on the heights that um, where is where a lot of new um, refugees are settled. Um, and I, like in Nashua, for example, um, I think they have like one of our few majority minority house districts in the state. Um, so I think um, taking a look at where our existing pockets of diversity are and what causes them to be more diverse could be helpful in um, de applying those lessons to um, other areas of the state that um, might want to diversify as well. Thank you, Representative Gerhard. Thank you, Madam Chair. So my initial feeling on this is I don't really trust government. And I know that during World War II, the U.S. government used census data to round up the Japanese. So I'm just curious what your concerns are. Have you thought about maybe this data being used for purposes unintended? Um, I mean, I think data is data. I would oppose the use of internment as I, – I, I would not see that as meeting the spirit of – this bill, um, yeah, um, yeah, I think that would be illegal if well, the, the Fed, the feds would probably come after us if we tried doing something like that. The and, feds did do it. That's what I'm well, telling you. Thank you. Yeah, well, let's. You're, we're getting really far afield from the yeah. topic of the bill, so I, I'd like to concentrate on that. Are there any other questions relative to the bill? Representative Bailey and then uh, Gould. <laughs> Wouldn't it be sim simpler and cheaper if we just identified as being more diverse than we are? Appropriate, <laughs> Appropriate question. Representative Gould. Right. Do you think the census data is accurate for diversity in New Hampshire as it exists? Um, I do not believe, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think I'm qualified to answer that question at the moment. Um, but um, I can uh, I can look into it and get back to you about that. Thank you. Follow Thank up. Thank you. Follow up. Thank you, Representative Gallagher, for taking my question and for being willing to look into it. I think that um, that's something that – do you think that's something the commission could focus on is how accurately our census data does or does not reflect the diversity in New Hampshire? Um. I mean, yes, that is something that it could look into. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Representative uh, Gerhard. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm under the impression that you believe that diversity in these neighborhoods is a good thing and it's good for the state. Is that correct? Yes, I do. How? What metric are you using to determine Follow that? Up. Follow up, please. But what, so my point being is in these areas, in let's say Manchester or Nashua or Concord, where it's very diverse, what metrics can you point to that say that this is good for the state, community, et cetera? Um, mostly subjective ones. Um, I mean, just as a person, I like being around diversity, and I know a lot of my neighbors do too, um, but I don't have any hard 
data specifically, and I think that um, yeah, I, I I'm not really sure what metric would be appropriate. Um, I, 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 I'm kind of afraid that if cer certain metrics, um, if we tried using um, certain metrics here that they could be misused. Um, so yeah, that's all I'm going to say on that. I don't know, follow up. Um, I think he's answered your question if you don't mind. Are there any uh, relevant questions for Representative Gallagher? Sorry. He's, he said he, that the, his criteria are subjective and I think that answers your question. Representative Horrigan. All right, yeah, thanks. Oh. I mean, I'm a co-sponsor of the of this bill. In fact, I was in the EDA when Resident Gallagher's first version of the bill last year came through, and it kind of uh, fell victim to a bunch of accidents, including the fact that, uh, unbeknownst, I think even the members of the committee, the committee, the uh, commission had been accidentally deleted during the budget trailer bill process while they're renaming. Uh, was it called the Department of Business and Economics? Yes. They were like renaming what used to be known as Dread. They gave it a more name and but anyway um for and uh, i put in a pink card for the next bill so i don't want to go, go on the top of that bill except to say i think this is a good commission it's a valuable one and it's it's i supported it being revived uh last year in fact it kept the meeting even after they uh they officially abolished it um and um we heard uh this is a very simple bill, as uh, Reverend Gallagher aptly pointed out. It's, it costs nothing, and I think it should be doing it anyway, which is considering racial and ethnic data. And I think the goal of increasing the answers ethnic diversity is a good one. Um, first of all, I say we're the I discovered yet we're the second oldest state in the union. We have an average age of forty three point one when the twenty twenty census was taken. We're just ahead of Vermont, which is forty three point zero. Just well, Maine is even older than us, 45.0. So and Maine's the oldest state. So the three north of New England, we're the oldest uh, region of the country. So it's not Florida. It's not anywhere else. It's, it's you know, it's not, you know, it's not the Great Plains state. It's it's us. Um, and I think uh, that's, and um, we're also one of the less diverse states in the union. We're not quite as white as some people believe we are. We had got off on the tangent about the first nation primary. And I'm, I, my personal feeling is, uh, spite of what was going on uh, with the DNC, um, Secretary Scanlon will be uh, scheduling the New Hampshire primary for some time, probably in January. Um, certainly, I'll be voting. Reverend Gallagher, I'm sure, be voting. And I haven't decided which candidates support, but I'm, I would, I'm not ever, I might. Yes, uh, Representative yeah. Morgan, about the bill. Yes. Okay. So, to keep our economy growing, we need to bring in more ambitious young working people in the state, as uh, our governor said at the budget address a couple of days ago. And that means we're going to have to bring them in from other states or even other countries. And um, younger working adults in general are more ethnically diverse than older generations just because there's a, um, more people are, there's more interracial relationships. Uh, people are more tolerant of them than older generations might have been. And the places they come from are going to be much more diverse than New Hampshire. And even the uh, you know, white, well, I wasn't actually born in New Hampshire. I was born in Indiana. But even you know, white people like me prefer to stay in a place where anybody of any color is welcome. We don't want to be around a place. I think it'd be kind of boring to be around in a, have to live in a place where everybody was looked like me. I like having a variety of people there. And we've been having a lot of trouble encouraging our young people of any color to stay stay here. We're like we're net exporter of college students, for example. So more diversity, I think that would make New Hampshire more attractive place for ambitious young people to, well, it says my rent pursue their dreams or uh, of course, there's also the stay, work, and play initiatives. That's another uh, phrase I could use to stay, work, and play in New Hampshire. So uh, please vote not to pass on HB 64 to keep, uh, to um, make New Hampshire a more, more vibrant, more, more diverse state with a more, you know, with a uh, stronger economy and a stronger, you know, stronger everything. So that's, thank you, Representative Oregon. Are there any Looks questions? Like I got a question here. Representative Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
So are you saying that the Commission on Demo Demographic Trends doesn't consider race and ethnicity now? Well, that's... Uh... Is that what this is that what you're saying? I'm just I'm just affirming that they that they should be. I um I'm not as familiar with it as Representative Gallagher is, but I've looked at the minutes of some of the meetings yet and they I mean they have been considering it and certainly uh there's data not just in the decennial census but in the uh surveys the census bureau takes every year and there's other data and they it's just uh, they already are considering it, but this just like encourages them to consider it even more. At least that's my understanding. Follow up. See what I'm trying to figure out is what's broken that you're trying to fix. Um, well, we we are having we are having trouble. Uh, our con one of the things is stifling our economy is, is a shortage of uh, you know young young people who are raising families who are at the prime of their career. And um, one of the things, I mean, there's many things that are uh, discouraging people from moving here from elsewhere and discouraging young people staying. I think part of it maybe is the perception that we're very white and white bread type of state. And uh, I think also the younger generation is just, it wants to be around diverse people. You know, they don't, even though, even though like white supremacist groups get a disproportionate amount of attention, uh, most people are in New Hampshire and across the USA are very tolerant and want to be, live in a tolerant place. And I also say like your community in Rochester, for example, and Reginald O'Brien's, those are two places that are doing a lot to drive the uh, growth of our of our state not just within their own city limits but you know statewide and uh, those are also two relatively diverse diverse places and getting more diverse so thank you madam chair i i, I didn't get my question answered oh sorry that. well I mean, yes, i'm sure they're very they... good are there any other uh, well, questions sorry. representative o'brien Thank you, Madam Chair. I know time is nice, so I'll be yeah. struck to the point. Representative Oregon, thank you for taking, uh, taking my question. I see you kicking the ball yeah. for a very good goal. Yeah. Okay. But I don't see the follow through. And the thing is, I agree with Representative Abeer in like her question, collecting data and everything else. Mm -hmm. But in the example, and I, I would mm -hmm. like to thank Representative Gallagher for recognizing what the good people and the yeah. citizens of Nashua have yeah. done. Workforce housing, other tip and things. I mean, maybe this commission is okay. Maybe we should channel into mm -hmm. something else. I mean, is it a problem with the bill? Is it data collection? Or is there other issues? Well, it's just a very simple bill which costs nothing and... Um... So I certainly agree, you know, all the data is useless unless we're following through on it, but that's a matter for other bills and other communities. This is just a small step that will be. Okay. Thank you, Representative Thank you. Oregon. Does anyone else wish to testify on House Bill 64? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. and open the public hearing on House Bill 228 and call Representative Ger Griffin. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Gerald Griffin, and I represent Hillsborough 42, consisting of the towns of Mount Vernon, Linebro, and New Boston. I am the sponsor of HB 228. HB 228 repeals a section of RSA 12, and by doing so, eliminates the Commission on Demographics. The current Commission on Demographics was created last year by HB 1106. That same bill eliminated the previous Commission on Demographics. To put HB 228 in perspective, 
it is helpful to look at the history of the earlier commission. And with the chair's permission, I will do that. I believe the initial commission was created in 2016 and arose from an earlier study group who recommended that the state hire a demographer. Uh, then, then Representative uh, Tennessee, later Senator Hennessy, was the sponsor of the initial bill. She later became the chair of the committee. That initial bill called for the commission to support a newly created demographer position and consider any legislation that might arise as a result of that support. The demographer position was created, but to my knowledge, it has never been filled. And so from its outset, one might say the initial commission was a commission without a mission. Now back to HB 228. There are four reasons I put the bill forward, and I'd like to outline those for you. First, it is a commission with a vague mission. The underlying law says in part, the commission will create a biennial scorecard on New Hampshire's demographic condition and trends. A scorecard suggests to me that we measure against some objective standard, but the law is silent on what that standard is. Secondly, the commission is a duplication of efforts. Professor uh, Andrew Johnson and his team over at UNH study demographics and death and produce excellent reports. At one of our recent finance hearings, I asked Peter Caswell, the director of the Department of Business and Economic Affairs, if his department used those reports. He indicated they did, in, they did in fact use those reports and use UNH as a resource on demographics. Those of us who serve in finance and ways and means spend several days at the beginning of each biennium getting up to date on the New Hampshire economy, the housing market, the real estate market, and of course, the changing dem demographics of our state. This last month, Professor Johnson delivered his report, and it was very detailed and very well done. Third, the underlying law is deficient in several respects. The law is vague about its mission. The law calls for membership as follows, four House members, one Senator, the Director of the Department of Business and Economic Affairs, or his designee and six members from the public. That's 12 total members, with seven members constituting a quorum. During the time I served on the earlier commission, the most public members we ever had was two, both of whom were excellent and brought much to the table. But we started with a deficit of four public members which did not leave much room for error. In fact, as the first named House member of the new commission, I called the organizational meeting of that, of that uh, commission to elect a chair. Only three members showed up. And without a quorum, I recessed the meeting until such date as a quorum could be found. That date has not yet arrived. Finally, for all above reasons, this commission is a squandering of valuable resources that should not be spent in the duplication of work that is being done so well by our own UNH. We only have 24 senators, and we know each one of them a stretch very, very thin. I know the Speaker's office is often challenged to fill the many positions resulting from the many, some say too many, some say way too many commissions and study groups we have created. 
Finally, we are fortunate to have citizens who are willing to help and contribute their time. But we must ensure that we ask them to serve in a meaningful way and that we don't squander their participation. I know they are a scarce resource because during my service on both the prior commission and the current one, we never had more than two public members. Despite, in the case of the last commission, my repeated requests and emails to fill the vacancies. I am happy to take any questions. Thank you, Representative Griffin. Representative Billman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative, for taking my question. Uh, we heard previous testimony just before yours that uh, the work on these commissions is free. It doesn't cost anything, uh, especially in light of mileage to be paid, uh, people from uh, state government to fulfill uh, clerks to publish the uh, the minutes and the uh, the notes. Do you agree that the that these don't cost anything? No. In fact, that's why I'm here. These commissions are very expensive, and in, in terms of. Uh, the number of House members, a senator, and uh, the general public. So we should be very, very careful how we spend those those people who basically volunteer their time. We should be very careful how we spend that resource. Other questions? Your Representative Broder. So I just want to make make sure I understood what you said, so that the, the the commission on demographics hasn't really been as a result of the legislation that was passed recently has not met. Is that correct? I'm sorry, I didn't. You let me speak, let me speak a please. little bit louder. I just want to make sure that I understood what you said in your testimony, that the demo, the um, commission on demographics that was originally that was set up in the most recent legislation has not met. Is that correct? It, I did call the organizational meeting of the most recent legislation. And uh, as I said, three people showed up. Three people is not a quorum. So I recessed the meeting until such time as there was a quorum. I checked a few days ago to see where the membership of that committee stood. And currently, there is only one name on that committee, and that name is as a House member. And unfortunately, that particular House member lost her election in the last election cycle. So literally, there's, there's, there's no one currently assigned to the commission. Representative Shewitt. Thank you, Madam Chair. So basically, you were unable to get a quorum because appointments to the commission were not made. Is that correct? There were appointments made to the commission. The speaker's office did make appointments. Um, I can't speak for the, the Senate has to make their appointment and the public members typically are appointed, I believe by the governor, I know by the governor's office. I know there were, uh, uh, the House members were appointed because I was one of them. Uh, I can't speak for the other entities. Thank you. Representative Goldley. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, this is probably a little bit of a question towards you. I know there's a special committee on committees and commissions. And is areas like this going to be addressed in that committee or a special committee? And I'm just wondering whether we should wait to act on this because if this is a recommendation you know we should probably take action I mean, at a later date the chair of that committee is representative dolan so i'll ask him how he thinks about that <laughs> <laughs> um, short answer is yes excuse me are you saying we should not pass this bill to save you the work no, of filling I, this commission this will this issues like this will be addressed in, in that uh, that committee, uh, committees that don't meet, or that don't have time to meet, or are gone by, the issue has gone by, and this, this, particular bill. this particular bill is is not on our docket yet, but 
uh, it will be one of the first ones that the first commissions that we'll be looking at to try to eliminate it, uh, and save save some government you know government spending. Would you feel we stepped on your t your committee's toes if we? Uh, um, actually, I think this is more for the executive session than for the than for the hearing. I apologize. Are there any specific questions for Representative Griffin? Yes, Representative Gould and Representative Shiro. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for taking my question. And you may not be able to answer this, but I wondered if in the um, reports you look at from Professor Johnson at UNH, if UNH is reporting race data as part of the demographics that, that you've seen. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the work they do over there is very complete. They, uh, they not only have the U.S. Census, I believe they use the university's ability to do polling within the state of New Hampshire. And so uh, it's a resource that's, that's available to the legislature. It's a resource that uh, Director Caswell told me he uses. And uh, his area of business development includes the planning department, which the demographer was supposed to be part of. So yes, uh, very, very good work done over there. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Shua and then A. Bear. Thank you. My chair, my uh, question is actually for the chair also, uh, or perhaps Representative Dolan. Is there a means by which committees that are confronted with items like this can officially refer their bills to that committee? If some bills have been referred to those committees, this is not one of them, so therefore it's on our plate to make a decision. If we decide not to pass this bill, then the that commission is still committee is still able to review it under their charter. Okay, my my question though is, it seems there should be a mechanism. One to would think so, but but this not, is not an early bill, therefore it is not one of the ones that would be referred to that commission. All right, They've thank you. They've got to research it on their own. Thank you, Representative Dola. I, is this a, if it's processed, let's finish with the, the witnesses first. We can. Okay, any other questions? Uh, Representative Abair, please excuse me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for your testimony today. And I was doing a quick search trying to find the annual report that's supposed to be filed with the governor, the Speaker of the House. If you could send me that link, that would be handy. Thank you. You're not alone in having that problem. When I first got appointed to the prior committee, I pulled a file from the fourth floor of the uh, office building, this building, and uh, I went through that file, and I was unable to locate a single report that had been done. And as far as the most recent committee, the one we're here talking about, uh, we have, we have, uh, never met with a full quorum, so there is no report. Thank you. Other questions? Representative Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Madam Chair. If your commission had been meeting and, and doing what it was uh, tasked to do, would you be considering data on race and ethnic background? I, I, it's hard for me to answer for a whole commission, but as 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 a member, that's the the charge of the commission. Really, was to look at demographics, and it would one, one of the un, one of the underlying problems with that was we first had to educate everybody on that commission on demographics, and so. Typically, what would happen is the commission would be appointed, a chair would be appointed, and then we would have people come in just as ways and means and finance does at the beginning of each biennium. And they would testify and present situations on the demographics and housing and the economy and all the related items. 
And yes, that's uh, demogra- That's what demographics is. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Griffin. Representative Gallagher. I um Representative Gallagher again. Um so yeah, I'll keep this short since um but yeah, basically since my previous bill assigns additional duties to the commission, um I would oppose the disbanding of it as that would conflict with my previous bill. Um I think as to the point of um, one of the reasons to disband it being its mission is vague. Well, I think that's one of the things that my bill helps with is that it makes it less vague. Um, as to the point of the um, data also being available from UNH, well, U- UNH works together with um, people on this committee. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think there is a possibility that removing the committee could um, arm the quality of UNH's own data, um, and yeah, I think um, I think having it be um, an official state body rather than uh, a university one uh, helps to give it extra credibility and um, just it, it, it provides a, it, it provides a different purpose than a university might and um, so I think it's worth keeping around and I'll take any questions now. Thank you for your testimony. I don't see any questions so. Representative Oregon. Thank you. Thank you very much. I represent Timothy Oregon from Stratford County District 10, which is in fact the home of UNH. And certainly UNH does have um, a wide history of uh, strength in the area of demographic and social research. And um, but and the uh, commission, um, if we and if we can, it, the the commission, um, I think compliments 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 that work. Um, I'm not sure if the cost of these commissions, whether you consider the mileage very expensive or not. That's uh, you know, it's uh, usually that that only kicks in if the person makes a special trip to Concord or wherever the commission is meeting. Anyway, if you're already going to Concord, you don't get double mileage for attending the commission. At least I hope that's not how it works. I have to confess, even though I've been here 13 years, I've never served on a, uh, statute, a statutory, I've never been one of the people, any of the speakers as appointed to a statutory committee. In fact, I don't even recall really being actively actively invited. The Of all the speakers I served on, the one who was the most interested in filling these seats was uh, my first speaker, Speaker Norelli, and it's been less of a priority for the other speakers. And uh, Meg, I think I probably did get a, we did get some somewhat perfunctory email from our majority leader saying if you're interested, uh, join. But hasn't they're not really very actively recruiting the House members for these, these committees. In my appo- appointment, I am a me- have been a member of two, of a committee and also then a board um, that's under the aegis of the Secretary of State's office, which isn't technically a statutory committee because they did it under their own authority. And um, yes, Representative yeah, Corrigan, and, uh, about this bill. Yes, so I think if the uh, I think the uh, mission, I think obviously there's an endemic problem. And actually, well, actually where that connects is the Secretary of State's office has very strong institutional support for the boards and committees that are under its purview. So, you know, they, in fact, uh, Senator Hennessy, who wrote the bill that reconstituted the committee, was one of the people who invited me to be on the board that I'm on now. But, um, and she strongly supported keeping the commission around. But, um, 
So I think maybe we may we may need more institutional support for all these committees, statutory committees. But I think this one is a particularly valuable one because uh, we need, you know, we need to become a younger and more diverse state. You know, we we need ambitious young people coming um, from other parts of the country. They're more diverse than ours. We need to keep our ambitious young people who grew up here in New Hampshire growing New Hampshire. And um, so the issues, and certainly the issues that the previous bill addressed are amongst those that uh, the state government has to address in order to keep our young people here and also, um, and that's this commission is a valuable re resource from it, regardless of whether or not it's actually being, reaching its full potential, which it apparently at the moment it's not. Um, so, and you may need to, you may need to, uh, re you may need to uh, restructure it uh, Runs the seventy six members appointed by the governor. Hopefully, since he actually talked about this in his budget address, maybe filling those six slots is now going to become a higher priority yes, for his office. You. But yeah, so I think anyway, we should keep the committee around, and that that doesn't uh, necessarily it doesn't necessarily change the fact that there's the committee on commissions and other bodies are looking at all these committees, commissions, and so forth. But this particular one, uh, we should keep it around. We should keep it around, and we should uh, make an effort to. Uh, make it more viable so thank you thank you representative Horrigan. yeah thank you representative schmidt thank you madam chair for the record peter schmidt representing stratford 14 which is the City of Dover Ward One, um, and I decided to speak on this issue because uh, I had the privilege about 15 years ago, I think, to hear a lecture over at the Tuck Library across the street uh, by uh, Peter Francis, uh, who is uh, a very noted demographer. I'm not sure whether he has died in the meantime. I hope not, because he's uh, a brilliant guy and very knowledgeable. It was a, a, an extremely instructive uh, presentation that he made. Um, and I've just sent you a, uh, an email, forwarded you uh, an article by Brad Cook, uh, who is a noted New Hampshire yes. attorney. Uh, on this, and he's writing on the subject of demographics in New Hampshire, among other things. Um, and I, I, I would ask the chair to distribute it to the rest of the committee, um, because uh, I, I think we uh, abandon this committee uh, or commission that Representative Griffin has talked to us about at our own peril. Uh, while I sympathize with him uh, in his. Uh, uh, dearth of um, committee members or commission members. Uh, I know what it's like because <clears throat> I'm, uh, the, I was the surviving member, if you will, of the Joint Committee on Employee Classification. Um, and uh, it's one of our very important committees. I, but please bear with me. I'm only taking a few minutes. <clears throat> and the, the thing is, the governor and his staff are extremely busy in terms of filling uh, required committees and commission positions. Uh, and it may be a while before he, uh, he, can, he and his people can get around to this current commission. So I sympathize with Representative Griffin. Um, but d demographics is, is like gravity. You can't get away from it. And, uh, and the reality is, that if we don't know anything about New Hampshire's demographics, aside from the fact that the, that Professor Johnson is doing an admirable job, but the state also needs to be on top of the situation. So I think we need to think about it very carefully before we um, jettison this particular commission. And I urge you all to read the email that I just sent to, to uh, Representative McGuire, uh, because uh, it's, the, it, our demographics are a, a, a slow dive off the diving board. The dive can be slow, but once you're off the board, gravity takes over. So, uh, and demographics are already doing a number on the state of New Hampshire. So, thank you. I'll, I'll answer any questions anybody may have. Representative Gerhardt. 
<laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just a little confused as to why the government has to be doing this. For instance, U-Haul tracks uh, where... Let him answer that question. Oh. Why do you think the, go the government should be doing this? You mentioned that specifically, and Representative Gerhard is questioning why you think it's important. Well, I we have a lot of uh, functions as uh, members of the state legislature, um, and uh, so that that's one of our functions is to determine whether certain things are wise in in our judgment as a committee, um, and uh, I'm. Not, and I'm not sure that the government necessarily has to be the only one doing it, uh, but to the degree that you have something as absolutely crucial to the further uh, benefit uh, and survival of the state of New Hampshire as we know it, uh, I think the government uh, ought to be paying some attention to that. Okay, follow up. Well, the reason I'm saying this is, first off, the U-Haul and other companies actually track where people are moving from within the United States. So they can say, for instance, this is 2021, but Tennessee was the state that most Americans were moving to, for instance. So my, my concern is just the government is not most likely to be the most accurate producer of this information when it can be tilted by the political winds, as we've seen recently, last couple of years. So I'm just concerned about putting all that. You know what I'm saying? It seems like a waste of money. That's what I'm concerned about. But thank you. I take your point, but uh, I think that that's our function as the EDNA committee is to examine the bills that come before us and the issues they raise and to exercise our best judgment on whether the bill is a wise idea or not. Thank you, Representative Schmidt. Well said. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Mr. Clegg, do you wish to testify on this bill? Okay, well, in that case, he's the only other person here. So I will close the public hearing on House Bill 228. All right. We're going into executive session. Does someone have a motion about House Bill 64, which was the first one Madam we heard Chair. this morning? Madam Chair, I'll yes. move ITL. All right. Is there a second? OK, Shewitt and Gould. How would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, um, actually, I'll, uh, I'll read the committee statement that I've already <laughs> composed. <laughs> Well, listen, congratulations, to Representative Shewitt, on your proactive attitude. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, uh, while the goals of the sponsor are laudable, uh, there does not seem to be an appetite on the part of the legislature or the executive to fulfill this since they did not provide the necessary appointments. Uh, the testimony indicated that UNH wishes to study this issue and there's nothing preventing them from doing so. And they certainly would share any findings and information with the government if we asked. Okay, Representative Gould, do you wish to speak to your second? I think um, Representative Schuett said it well. I would um, just add that in an environment, and, and I've heard this for the last 10 years, the aggravation with the number of commissions and the expense, and to keep a commission that is clearly not being active and uh, doesn't excuse have- Excuse me, Representative Gould. Or, um, oh, no, uh, I just want to make sure you knew this right. was about House Bill 64, 64 right. expanding and so, the scope. And so um, expanding the scope of a, of a commission to replicate something that UNH is already providing uh, doesn't seem necessary. Thank you. Okay. Representative O'Brien. Thank you. For a different reason, I am, uh, I am not going to support this. Uh, yes, this bill, the original commission is very lofty. I think it's worthwhile. It should be, in my opinion, should be kept to take a look at. But 
what is being done out of this? And to me, it's like in a good golf swing, it's the follow through. So what is the follow through with this? It's time to look, and it is not covered in this bill, or not should be covered in this bill. It should be other things. Start looking at workforce housing, other type of things that would increase the demographics in a particular community. So if the fixing of the demographics is what we need to fix, I think this bill falls short and actually it'll, it'll compile the information but it falls short of the follow through to reach that lofty goal. Thank you. Okay, other comments? Yeah, my, Representative Gerhard. Thank you, Madam Chair. My concern is where's, I'm gonna hold off comments. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I, I'm Representative Dolan. I just wanted to get a clarification uh, Representative O'Brien just said, "Doesn't support. You don't support the ITL. Don't support the the commission." He doesn't. He supports the ITL because the bill does not support its goals. Got it. Is that Got correct? It. Right. It. Yeah. Exactly. It it identifies another problem when it, I think there's a bigger there's something else under the rug. Yeah. Okay. Is Representative Abear? Thank you, Madam Chair. I will not be supporting this bill based on one fact. The bill says that basically we want to measure what we have for diversity in New Hampshire, yet the testimony contradicts that by saying we want to increase the diversity. Thank you. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm, I don't know much about demographics, but I do know that race, race and ethnicity are what one of the components of demographics and if we have a commission on demographics it will automatically consider race and ethnicity so i don't think it's necessary to tell them to do that um, and so i'm supporting the itl anybody else okay in that case the motion is itl on house bill 64 and the clerk can call the roll representative simon yes Representative Lakers. Yes. Representative Bailey. Yes. Representative Dolan. Representative Bear. Yes. Representative Gerhard. Yes. Clerk votes yes. Representative Groda. Yes. Representative Schmidt. Yes. Representative Goley. Yes. Representative Schuett. Yes. Representative O'Brien. Yes. Representative Davis. Yes. Representative Fitzpatrick. Yes. Representative Gould. Yes. And the chair. Yes. And we got to vote 16 yay, 0 nay. The motion passes 16 to 0. Uh, is there any objection to consent? Okay, seeing none, we'll put that one on consent. And do you think we should consider House Bill 228 as well? Or should you do? Okay, Representative Grody, do you have a motion? I do. I um, move out of pass on, two to, on House Bill 228. Is there a second? Representative Gerhard, all right. Representative Grota, do you wish to speak to your motion? I do. Thank you. I've served on several, several commissions, and these commissions are important to my constituents. And I can tell you that as the chair of these commissions, I spend a significant amount of time confirming people's attendance, um, people's appointments. And it's not because people don't care, it's because they are busy. We have a lot of responsibility as legislators in New Hampshire. So that when an organization like the college, the University of New Hampshire is doing something and the work is being done by people that are experienced and knowledgeable, I think it's important to partner with our institutions such as UNH to, to help us with the work. So I'm disappointed to have heard that the commission did not meet. There were no reports. And 
Although when we're talking about money, we're not talking about mileage. We're talking about people's time. I don't know about your time, but my time is valuable. I place a value on the amount of time I spend coming to Concord, sitting on commissions, going to delegation meetings. And I do those things because they are valuable to my constituents and therefore valuable to me. But my time is worth something. And I'd like to think that everybody has that viewpoint. So I'm sorry if I sound, I just, when people say to me, things don't cost anything, it drives me crazy because it does. So, um, so I don't, if the commission's not meeting, I just don't think we should continue it. I would recommend that we take a look at it again at a, you know, I mean, it's such a, has a tiny little scope. And I think that if we're going to do something like that, we should look at it as a whole thing. And you know you can you can increase affordable housing, but then we're going to do force people of certain demographics to go there. I mean that doesn't make any sense. So um, I I think this is serious, and I think that you know these are all the reasons why I support passing this. And this is not easy because I do believe in diversity. I do believe in having, but if it's not going to happen, it's not going to happen. You can't force something like that. I don't believe you can. So um, anyway, I'm so sorry this is so long-winded, but I think it's important to talk about these things and to express our thoughts on this because this is a big deal. Thank you. Representative Gerhard, you're just speak. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will agree with, with Representative Gerda that Time is valuable, and I don't think it should just be calculated in dollars and cents. And I, I really did not realize the amount of time involved with this whole Conquer gig until I actually got here. And this is, you guys, yeah. Anyway, so I just, as far as the demographic trends and stuff, and I understand that we want to increase young families moving to New Hampshire, but I'm, I think that's more accomplished through the free market and just lowering taxes and making it easier for families to live here. I don't think it's a matter of putting up the right billboard on the Massachusetts border or any of that kind of stuff. I just think just you need to make the society that you want. So if you want more people to have kids, offer to take care of people's kids and stuff like that. I just think it's a local individual level. So point being, I agree and thank you. Okay, thank you. Other comments? Representative Schmidt, of course, is opposed. So I oppose uh, uh, an ought to pass because most of us, even myself, do not know enough about this subject, and we're throwing away a commission. We should be retaining this bill to find out. It sounds to me like the structure of the commission is flawed at the very least. Uh, I, I don't see any reason why there should be four reps, for example, on such a such a commission. Uh, we know that the Senate, you know, doesn't like to serve on these committees and. And the, the bills in my early years here, the, commis the such bills always had two or three senators, and every time, virtually, the 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 Senate would strip it down to one senator. So uh, they 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 are really stretched thin, as I'm sure even the freshmen recognize. It's a 24/7 job if they're going to do it right, uh, and and um, and some of the people do not have that kind of time. So, but uh, but the point is that to abandon this commission when some of us know next to nothing about the demographic situation and we need to get informed before we junk a commission that's looking at demographics. So I will be opposing uh, the, uh, the ought to pass. Thank you. Okay, anyone else, Representative Gould? Now is when I can say my, my part about with we have commissions that are really urgent and with such a, a trend toward overtaxed and overuse that we heard from Representative Griffin um, and everyone else's testimony, I think it's important that we focus the limited resources on matters that are urgent, which isn't to say demographics isn't urgent, but I really like the fact that I heard from Representative Griffin that UNH is providing the information so we all can get educated about demographics. Thank you. Representative uh, Dolly and then uh, Lachis. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. And I want to thank Representative Griffin for trying to get this ball started and, you know, unfortunate that we didn't have the folks there available. And also thank him for the information brought forward that the university system is providing some of this, a great deal of this information, and it is being used by both finance and ways and means, which is good to hear that that information is out there and available. And um, I think we all know that with this special committee, we are looking at a number of committees and commissions that we are overtaxed with here and trying to support with the limited amount of time legislators and senators have um, that if, if information is available without having to put together a commission or, or committee, um, that is the way to go. Thank you. Okay, Representative Blackus. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I understand the, the desire to educate members of the House on this, but I, I don't see that having this commission would be particularly effective. What might be more effective is you know, get a notice in the calendar to let everyone know that this resource at UNH is available, link off to the report, and if they want to get into it further, let them know um, how they can contact the people there. Uh, I think that'd be much more effective than creating this commission, which may, even if it does meet, it might generate a report. I, I think it, I don't know that it's gonna be, it's unlikely to be anything better than what we already have in UNH. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Is that, all right. In that case, the motion is ought to pass by Representative Groda and the clerk can call the roll. Representative Simon. Yes. Representative Lakers. Yes. Representative Bailey. Yes. Representative Dolan. Yes. Representative Abair. Yes. Representative Gerhard. Yes. Clerk votes yes. Representative Groda. Yes. Representative Schmidt. No. Representative Goley. Yes. Representative Schuett. Yes. Representative O'Brien. Yes. Representative David Davis. No. Representative Fitzpatrick. Yes. Representative Gould. Yes. 14 yeas, 2 nay. Oh, in the chair. Oh, I'm sorry. I voted for you. Yes. Uh, I apologize. Yes, really. No more days off. I, I got it the first time. It is 14 to 2. Yes. Okay. Um, 15 to 2. Uh, no, because there's 16 people here. Okay. 14 to, the motion passes 14 to 2. Uh, do you object to consent? Yes. Okay. It'll be on the regular calendar. Does it, do uh, either of you wish to put write a minority report? I need to be here. Uh, if so, at your very earliest convenience. And let, let me know as soon as you decide to do so. Unless Representative Davis wants to. No? Okay. Oh, jump right in. Come on, <laughs> <laughs> hey, trust me, majority report is easier. All right. Uh, in that case, we are closing the executive session. And you, I owe you a card. Okay. We're not sure if he's going to do it. Oh, okay. I got it. You are just so efficient, Mr. Chair. We don't have any other cards for this, right? This bill? Oh, yeah, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're doing well this far. Oh, okay. Good. Looks like you have some coming. Have you got the long chairs? Yeah, we got that. All right, I would like to open the public hearing on HB 564 and welcome Representative McGuire. Yes, thank you. I'm uh, Carol McGuire, representing uh, the towns of Allenstown, Dunbarton, Epsom, and Hooksett. And relevant to this bill, I was I'm the chair of the committee to recommend amendments to the building code. And this, <clears throat> 
and this bill was a recommendation of the committee to do to recommend amendments and it recommends amendments um, so the board the board of um, the building code review board met in november and approved a number of amendments which i sent out to you last night and this bill ratifies those amendments to the state building code and the fire fire uh the state board of fire control recommended some in september and it re this ratifies those as well um, the leaders of both the building code review board and the board of fire control are here if you have questions about the details of the amendments i'm just here to say that they're they were recommended by the relevant boards and as far as i can tell we should be ratifying them thank you very much are there any questions yes representative Grota. thank you um and perhaps you might be okay in this this but maybe one of the boards might were the changes um I'm just trying to find, I'm looking for the word. Were the changes motivated by safety or ch changes in um, available technology, do you know? Uh, you, you'd have to get the details. The ones that I remember specifically were to s settle conflicts within the codes or to allow options that were needed. Okay, that answers but they'll my give you the details. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, Representative O'Brien. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative McGuire, looking at the face of 564 and by committee, I don't mean to hang it up on that. It says education. Should that really, in future, be read as a, you know, EDNA? Uh, I don't know why this went to education, but as you can tell, it was very quickly vacated to the. To oh, so, oh, so it was committee. vacated. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes, Representative Lekas. Thank you. Uh, this question is either to you or if there's someone else who can answer it better. Um, I haven't had a chance to review the changes. Thank you for sending them. But the question is, um, what changes, if any, uh, that are being proposed um, are expected to increase the cost of building in any way? Uh, this gets into the concern. Well, anyway. I believe that's... you should, for the building code, you should ask... Uh, well, you should ask the other people for the details. I don't have it. I don't understand. Right. Thank you. Them well enough to answer that question. Anyone else? Thank you very much, Representative. Uh, Philip Sherman. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I think I can answer some of the questions that were asked. Uh, I'll provide a quick summary statement, and then I have copies of each of the amendments if anybody wants to get into the details. So the Building Code Review Board is pleased to forward eight building code amendments to the current New Hampshire State Building Code with our recommendation that these be ratified. These amendments have been reviewed and approved by the board after a public hearing. And they include three amendments which relax energy requirements for changes of occupancy in existing buildings. So that's a reduction in cost. Four amendments that came out of the grease interceptor study with DES last summer. And that was, uh, there's probably no difference in cost. It just sorted out who was enforcing what and how some things were defined to bring our code into, into alignment and, and DES into alignment. So we met in the middle on some of that. Uh, and one amendment came from the solar industry. Uh, in, the, in the main building code, we referenced the fire code for solar panels on roofs. Uh, we neglected when we did that in 2018 to uh, fix the international residential code, which applies to single family homes. So all that amendment does is pull out the explicit requirements in the IRC and reference the state fire code where all of that solar stuff was worked out. Uh, so that was more a housekeeping issue. But in fact, it will, it will save some money over the model code. Uh, 
A Ninth Amendment, just, just to keep you in the loop, uh, involved some flood zone requirements, it was not approved by the board, and it's under further review, so that may come back later. So thank you for your consideration. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, Representative Lekas. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for those answers, and, and I'll be uh, looking at the uh, Greece interceptor stuff again. <laughs> um, but the, my larger question on cost is, well, first of all, what building code are we operating under now? And if we're, as I understand it, this is looking to adopt a newer building code, what changes between those two uh, would, you know, would increase cost and, and any general ideas to, to what extent? So these are amendments to the current building code. We're not going to a new model code. We're on the 2018 cycle with the 22 National Electric, uh, 2020 National Electric Code. None of these apply to that code. So these uh, all amend the code that's in place now. We're in a little bit of an interim year. Next year, uh, if things progress as we expect, we'll be back here to change the model codes to the 2021 uh, series of the seven, uh, seven that make up the building code. The electric code will follow by a year. Okay, thank you. Representative Greta? Can you be uh, more specific about <clears throat> the amendments that relax the energy savings? In the model code, if you are altering a building, so I, I have an office building and I'm gonna do some renovations, it's still gonna be an office building. There's a shopping list of things that you do not need to comply with energy conservation. For instance, instead of having to provide the proper amount of insulation in a wall, it only kicks in if you, if you open up that wall and then you only have to put as much insulation as will fit. You don't have to build a new outside wall. If you change the occupancy in the model code, none of those exceptions applied. So basically, if you went from uh, an office to a retail store, you'd have to meet the energy code as though it was a new building. So what those amendments do, and there's three of them that just pick up the different parts of the code, basically say that that list of exceptions that applies for alterations can also be used for changes of occupancy, therefore reducing the cost to, it's effective reuse of a building. If somebody wants to change what they're doing with it, it, it results in less energy conservation just for practicality. Follow up. Follow up. <clears throat> so this is for commercial space though, or is it just change of use for commercial to residential, or is it only within the commercial, res commercial sphere? It, it does not kick in for one and two family dwellings, but it does kick in for other residential, multifamily dwellings. Okay, thank you. You never change an occupancy for a one and two family dwelling or it's not a one and two family dwelling anymore. So. Representative Schmidt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, my question goes to one of your remarks about uh, a, a blending of uh, two sets of codes. I think uh, the building code the plumbing code or whatever, and and I'm wondering uh, the, whether you are referencing or we're referencing this working group that you and I, Representative McGuire, and several uh, a, num a number of other very experienced uh, uh, staffers and uh, craftsmen and so forth uh, from both the plumbing side, the uh, the, uh, the uh, environmental protection side, and so forth. Uh, work together. Is that the, the the working group that you were referencing in in your re remark about one of the changes that this bill would institute? That's correct. Uh, you'll recall that coming out of that, we issued a report and said that DES was going to amend their rules through their process. We were going to amend the the code provisions through the amendment process. So. Uh, a couple of those amendments apply to the International Plumbing Code and a couple apply to the Residential Code because we had to hit different sections of those codes. Thank you very much. Representative LeBron. Uh, I did have a question, but uh, not so much as for the gentleman, but uh, to uh, assist Representative Grota. But I think it could be best uh, handled, and I was gonna mention what the term we use in the business, grandfathering. 
but I think that could be handled in executive session. So thank yeah. you. Thank you. Right. Seeing no further questions, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Sean Toomey. Good morning. My name is Sean Toomey. I'm the state fire marshal. Uh, I'm going to speak specifically to the fire code provisions and changes. We're currently in the 2018 uh, state fire code as uh, as adopted and ratified uh, by the general court. Uh, we've uh, looked at two amendments to the fire code in the last uh, few months that came up uh, that we need to address. And the first one is uh, relative to NFPA 37, which concerns generator fuel lines. Uh, there's a requirement in the code that uh, you were not allowed to have a, a valve with a handle on it and the fuel line from the fuel tank to the generator for some reason. Um, what we discovered working with DES is they needed to, uh, they also need to uh, tightness test the fuel line to make sure there's no leak. And without that valve, you can't do that properly without taking the whole assembly apart and then trying to put it back together, which kind of defeats the whole tightness testing. So. There's very similar language in from a fuel tank to an oil burning appliance that allows the valve in place and you just remove the handle. So typically people wouldn't uh, mess with the handle after the tightness testing was done. So we align the language in NFPA 37 to have a valve in place and the handle removed. Um, so it matches the two appliances and it allows proper tightness testing from an environmental perspective. Uh, from a cost perspective, I'm guessing the valves will touch more, but there's probably less label, uh, labor taking it all apart and trying to defeat that part. The second amendment, uh, I'm just gonna to speak to briefly, but it's gonna come in as part of the amendment. I think uh, Representative McGuire will speak to in a minute, but if you want, I can speak to it later or now. It's up, I guess it's up to- If it's you know, uh, about the amendment specifically, we'll hold off until we get to the amendment. Wanna wait? Okay, yeah. so if as the bill is right now, that that's the only one uh, that's uh, being contemplated until the amendment comes in. I have one other one to add then. So okay. any questions, happy to answer them. Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Would anybody else like to testify on HP 564? Seeing no one, I'm going to close the hearing. And I am going to open the hearing on Amendment 2023-0091 for HB 564. And welcome back, Representative McGuire. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Carol McGuire, Merrimack District 27. And this is this amendment is at the request of the fire marshal. It includes one change to the state fire code that was adopted after House Bill five, uh, 564 was finished. So I had to come in with an amendment. It updates through the um, January meeting of the Board of Fire Control. And it also adds to the Board of Fire Control a fire protection engineer. Uh, the membership of the of the Board of Fire Control had been created quite some time ago, and now there are fire protection engineers in the state that would be willing to work, and the, the fire marshal believes their service on the board will be useful. So I, I support that. Yes, Representative Schiff. Uh, sorry, Representative Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking my question. I'm just curious, uh, is that fire protection engineer, is that a new uh, designation for an officer? Well, it's newer than the Board of Fire Control, which I believe is from the 60s. Uh, okay, thank you. I don't know how much newer I, uh, to be. Anyone else? Yes, Representative Lekas. I'll have questions on the amendment, but if, if you're, someone else is gonna Mr. answer Toomey's that, gonna I'll... be right, speaking to you. Me, yeah. 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 Thank you very much, Representative. Okay, thank you. Mr. Toomey, did you wanna? Again, Sean Toomey, the State Fire Marshal. And so the uh, the one amendment that we addressed uh, in January when we adopted the 2018 codes, we did a comprehensive review. Um, food trucks, mobile food units, so food trucks or trailers, they added a provision around gas uh, certification. So a gas um, 
it seemed like a great idea. So once a year, a gas technician would come in, take a look at the gas system on the mobile food truck or, or trailer, make sure it's safe and certify it. Well, when it came to practice, everyone kind of scratched their heads, the industry, and quite frankly, the fire service of how do we really do that? It seemed like a great idea. You just go and do an inspection, sign off on it. But where these trucks and trailers are on the move a lot, there's some question about really truly what standard should apply to the inspection. So, uh, so we look forward to the 2021 edition of the code. We talked to many other uh, communities. We talked to the gas industry and realized that the, the direction really is to put a gas detector in the truck or the trailer and uh, forgo the inspection the the benefit would be the gas detector would be when it's working would be sniffing for gas essentially or gas leak all the time it would alert the people in the trailer to evacuate if there was a gas issue and call 911 essentially so we uh we had a public hearing at the board of fire control everyone supported it um it was passed unanimously and is uh, brought forward for you for ratification uh the second one i can speak to the the uh, as far as the fire protection engineer goes um, as Representative McGuire indicated, the Board of Fire Control has been around for many, many years. I think some of the earliest stuff is back in like 1947. It does, I think in the 60s, 70s, there was a couple of small changes. There were a very limited number of fire protection engineers in the state. Um, 20 years ago when I became an engineer, I think there was, I was the fifth fire protection engineer that was around in, in New Hampshire. We probably have a dozen plus of them now, and I've had several ask, hey, why don't we have a fire protection engineer on the Board of Fire Control? We work to protect people from uh, fire and the effects of fire, do a lot of work in the code industry as far as building and fire codes. This, the Board of Fire Control serves an advisory capacity to me in the office and also uh, very active in the code development process uh, and evaluation on the, on the fire code side. So it seemed to make a lot of sense, um, and that's why we bring it forward to you today for incorporation on the Board of Fire Control. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions. Great. Are there any questions? Yes, Representative Gerhard. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> Concerning the mobile food detection, just this is going to be a multi-part thing, if that's okay. Just, yeah, just ask a question, let him answer, sure. and then you can ask for a follow-up. So the annual, the annual require, the inspection, how much was that? I've been told it varies by by contractor, essentially, but I'm hearing it's about $150 um, per per visit is what I was told by at least two vendors. The, pre, excuse me, the previous? Correct. Okay, so follow-up. Follow up. The gas detection device, how much is that, and how do you determine if those are working? Is there still a yearly inspection of that gas device now? That's what I'm curious about. So the devices that we found were around 50 to $100 um, and that they're intended to do a, like a monthly test. So to push the bunch, like we should test our smoke alarms on our homes, we'd push the button to test it to make sure that uh, they were functioning. Last follow-up. Follow-up. So, no, so are you required to test these gas monitors in these mobile food trucks? The fire service. Well, do they have any? Is there any way to actually enforce that? That they actually is such a device in these units, and that they actually are working. So, typically, uh, the food trucks are are licensed by the municipalities for their for allowing on the food service side, and it comes with that typical a fire a quick fire inspection. Uh, so, I would say that we the fire service would be able to check to see the devices in place. Uh, and I I don't I can't I would I can't say for sure whether every fire official in the state would physically touch them, but I would hope that they would look at them and at least make sure they're there. Um, there's some requirements in the code that talks about that the operator should be testing them by t depressing the button. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, Representative Schmidt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Morning, morning Marshall. Uh, so uh, the, the certification or licensing that you referenced just a moment ago with regard to uh, Representative Gerhard's question, uh, that inspection is done locally and that food truck is, is, is licensed for use in that community only, or is that that inspection and licensing allow that food truck to be on the, uh, the uh, road anywhere in the state of New Hampshire with with uh, or do they have to get licensed and, and permitted in every community they, that they sell in? Thank you. So I don't know that all the specifics on the food service licensing side. There, I will say there was a bill last uh, last session that talked about trying to do a statewide food truck license that would help minimize the requirements around licensing at each different community. So I think 
I think I know there's some communities that require licensure. Concord, I, I know, does from my previous time in Concord. Manchester does. Nashua does. Um, but I don't know that you get into the smaller communities, there's not that food truck license uh, requirement. Follow up. Follow up. What I'm concerned about is the possibility that there could be kind of a race to the bottom uh, that somebody would say, well, I, I, I couldn't get licensed uh, by the, uh, I, I have my food truck based in, let's say, uh, community X. Uh, I couldn't get licensed there because they know me, I'm, I'm sloppy, whatever, you know. Uh, and so they get licensed in, in community Y instead of community X because it's, it's easier to get, you know, passed there. Uh, and and I'm concerned about the, the the safety if there's not some kind of a, a correct standard that's being applied for for the safe operation of these trucks, which uh, are great facilities. I've I've bought from them, uh, but uh, but to the degree that they have a lot of not only food, so sanitation is a real important is, uh, issue, but also uh, if they're using gas and uh, and propane and that other kind of stuff their potential fire hazard. So I'm concerned about it. Could you speak to that? So I, I think the, uh, again, the bill last session was trying to address many of those comments that you were speaking of about the different community standards and things like that. In the, in the fire code provisions, uh, as they are today, the a fire official in a local community would be able to go and make sure that the, the unit's safe and operating safely under the, the provisions of the state fire code. The amendment that we talk about really just speaks to the a gas technician from, say, Irving or uh, Rhymes or some other company that comes in and does an inspection on that truck for for the gas system, uh, and, and instead puts that detector in. So uh, we can still the fire officials can go in and still make sure that the hood systems are operating properly. The the suppression for the hood is still there and functioning as a, and has been inspected that inspection requirements are still there um and we can make sure that the gas de detection device if this all gets ratified is there and is in place but we speaking to the food service side and the sanitation and those things that that's outside the perver purview of the state fire code and i, I don't know um unfortunately that still is going to i think vary community to community and, and this this really doesn't address that at all it wouldn't really be the appropriate spot to address it, in, in my opinion, under the fire code. One more. Yep, follow up. Do you have the staff, sufficient staff, to carry out that function? This this specific? The, the, this issue that I'm raising. You just said we, the inspector can do this or the fire official can do this. Do you have sufficient staff in your own organization to handle that? I would always love more staff, uh, <laughs> much like anyone else, right? Uh, I would say that we, in conjunction with the local fire departments, it would be a cooperative effort between our office and the local fire departments to get this this task completed um, with the food trucks. We, our office, would not personally go out and do all of these inspections of the trucks. We would rely on the help of the the local departments. Okay, thank you, Representative O'Brien. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Marshall. Perhaps maybe to clear clean some of that up. Uh, I'll let you the opportunity to discuss interoperability with many different agencies. It's not just the standalone of the fire marshal's office. So in the case of, like, let's use Nashua as an example, Nashua covers for public health a geographic area equally as well. Anybody come into the city with a food truck and everything has to be inspected. They do agree to spot inspections. They test the temperature of the food. How, what is the temperature of the hot water tank and different other parameters? And I don't think it's too far of a reach that they would check the, uh, the gas detectors equally as well, as well of what is required. So there seems to be a multi tier level of inspections because of this interoper interoperability of many agencies with the one focus goal to go with this. Would you agree? I, I would concur with that. I think the. The one thing, uh, speaking to Representative Schmidt's comment, is I think there was an intent to have a statewide license to try to minimize the changes. And again, this this doesn't contemplate that at all. But um, you know, I think 
maybe some for future discussion if there's trying to help the industry deal with a statewide license. But as far as the locals helping the locals, our office working with them, the food, the DHS, DHHS food ins inspectors work with the locals. There's a lot of cooperative work um, in dealing with that to try to make sure these units are safe. Yes, Representative Gold. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> and thank you for taking my question. Uh, I have a constituent who raised the very concerns we're talking about here. So I want to make sure I understand carefully. What this does is it changes the state rule that um, we live in a very rural area in Warner um, so that the Warner Fire Chief will be following this guideline and not require or, uh, the local gas person an additional $150, say, uh, inspection. Is that correct? Am I understanding it correctly? Yeah, we're neighbors, I think. No. <laughs> um, so the uh, the Chief France would and follow this provision uh, when, say, the Warner Fall Foliage Festival comes into town and there's mm -hmm. three or four food trucks that show up, mm -hmm. he would just go and make sure that that gas detector is there and that's it and not say, hey, did you have XYZ gas company do an inspection and certification and look for a certificate and that type of thing. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yes, Representative Weber. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess as I read this, as I've listened to all of the testimony, as I've checked with Pelham Fire Department, nobody sees a problem with this. This seems like this just streamlines, cleans a lot of things up, handles a few administrative things, gives some freedom back to the food trucks to have a monitor. They don't have to wait for an appointment for you guys to show up. Any, I, I haven't heard any opposition at all. Thank you. I, I have not either. I, this seems to be very welcomed. I think if we kept the current provisions as it is in the code today, requiring the gas certification by a company, that's that's the big concern for the food truck industry. And quite frankly, fire service, we don't really quite know how to deal with it. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you so much for your Thank testimony. you very much. Is there anybody else who would like to testify on Amendment 2023-0091? Seeing none, I will close the hearing. And I will hand the gavel back over to the chair. So, so I'll move ought to pass on 0091. Okay, thank you. So the ought to pass on the amendment is by Representative Schmidt, seconded by Representative Gould. Do you wish to speak to your motion? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, this is the kind of uh, service that we... Uh, uh, need to support the building code review board is uh, is well staffed and well uh, attended. I've been to their meetings in, in the past, uh, and they are uh, the gold standard as far as I'm concerned. So we've had the testimony from the from the chair, Chairman Sherman, um, but also from the fire marshal. So we should not delay on this. Thank you. Okay, Representative Gould. I just want to, on behalf of uh, food truck operators, young people who are trying to make a living, thank you for reducing costs without reducing risk. Well, without increasing risk, I hope. <laughs> I, I felt sure that was what you meant. All right. Does anyone else wish to speak on the amendment? Okay, seeing none, the motion is to adopt amendment. 0091 to House Bill 564 and the clerk made by Representative Schmidt and the clerk can call the roll. Representative Simon. Yes. Representative Lakers. Yes. Representative Bailey. Yes. Representative Dolan. Yes. Representative Weber. Yes. Representative Gerhard. Yes. Clerk votes yes. 
Representative Groda. Yes. Representative Schmidt. Yes. Representative Goley. Yes. Representative Schuett. Yes. Representative O'Brien. Oh, he stepped out. Representative Davis. Yes. Representative Fitzpatrick. Yes. Representative Gould. Yes. And the chair. Yes. 15 yay, zero nay. All right. We have the motion passes. Is there a motion? I'd like to make a motion of uh, ought to pass as amended on right. House Bill 564. Okay. Representative Leck. Second. Ought to pass and go Thank you. That ought to be ought to pass with an amendment. amendment. With amendment. All right. Right, right. There you go. It's not amended until the House Act. So. True enough. With amendment. We'll carry the amendment along. Do you wish to speak to your motion? I understand. Um, right. I, I, I think these are, you know, reasonable amendments. The reason I wanted to make the motion is that some of them include the uh, changes to the grease trap rules that were uh, negotiated and, and uh, you know, um, Mr. Sherman and others were involved when we had the uh, interim study uh, uh, committee on uh, on those. And I think these are, you know, nothing's going to reduce safety, and it's just, they're just practical things, I think, that uh, make things easier. Okay, Representative Goldie. I am all set. I think it was said well said by Representative Lekas. Okay. Does anyone else wish to, com to comment, question? All right, seeing none, the motion is ought to pass with amendment on House Bill 564. The clerk can call the roll. Representative Simon. Yes. Representative Lakis. Yes. Representative Bailey. Yes. Representative Dolan. Yes. Representative Hebert. Yes. Representative Gerhard. Yes. Clerk votes yes. Representative Groda. Yes. Representative Schmidt. Yes. Representative Goley. Yes. Representative Schuett. Yes. Representative Davis. Yes. Representative Fitzpatrick. Yes. Representative Gould. Yes. And the chair. Yes. 15 yay, zero nay. The motion passes 15 zero. Is there any objection to consent? Yes. Oh, yeah. Seeing none, we'll put always, this on consent. I don't always have first. And thank you. Close the executive session. The uh, committee report is due before next Wednesday. Um, and we'll be back at one. Thank you all. What? Up and Walker? Up, Up and Walker. Walker? Or the church? The church. St. Paul's? Oh, okay. Thank you.
hearing on House Bill 617, and I call Representative Gallagher. Um, so, I, I am, yeah, just for the record, for people who weren't with us previously, um, I'm Eric Gallagher, uh, representing Concord Ward 6, which is Marriott County District 20, and I am here to introduce um, House Bill 617, an act prohibiting with limit exceptions state ag agencies from requiring use of proprietary software in interactions with the public. Um, so, yeah, this I, I've been before this committee a few times previously with some of my other um, with some of my other bills um, that also came from the same bill that this was split off from last term. Um, this is another one that was part of last term's software act, um, which I was using as an acronym for securing our freedom to write and read everything. Um, so yeah, part of the criticism there was I was trying to do too much in a single bill. Um, so I uh, took that criticism to heart and then the split up into um, a bunch of different bills. Um, so yeah, most of them are coming back here to BDNA, but also one went to judiciary, one went to criminal justice, and then one is going to be going to ST&E. So that was a question last time around is why isn't this going to ST&E? Well, one of them is. Um, so this one is the part for um, what citizens can be required to use um, when they interact with the state. So um, yeah, it has a list of, it has a list of um, situations where it's supposed to apply to, um, you know, saying including but not limited to, meaning there may be others I forgot left out. Um, filing or payment of taxes, remote appearance for court proceedings, taking of standardized tests or completion of coursework by school students, applying for or receiving other unemployment benefits or other similar benefits. Um, unless the government has determined that proprietary software is the only means available for the required interaction. Um, so um, the thing is, um, so this this is just on the end of the public that it's applying to. Um, it's not saying anything about what the government itself can or can't use. It's just what it can require members of the public to use. So like when you're filing your Medicaid redetermination um, or um, food stamps, redetermination or whatever and need to upload proofs um, that they should accept it um, from people who wish to only use free and open source programs and don't wish to use proprietary ones, which should be pretty easy since um, a, a lot of documents are done in PDF format, which, um, yeah, is a portable format and um, most uh, most operating systems come with built-in support for it and, and including most <coughs> web browsers as well. Um, the, although although you, you, do, you do still see um, you do, do still see some older websites saying download Adobe Reader for this PDF but um, I I would think that those should be removed since they're kind of misleading since you don't actually need to use Adobe Reader um, to view PDFs. Um, it, um, so yeah, this is just the um, one part about, um, so 
the, the problem with proprietary software is it's basically a way of giving big tech companies control over you. And, you know, we're a very fiercely independent state here where we don't like other people telling us what to do. And um, uh, there are people who um, want to be able to tinker with their software to make changes with it so that they aren't being tracked or take, taken advantage of by the company that makes them. And they should be able to interact with the government just as easily as people um, who um, are okay with proprietary software. And um, so, yeah, to give a few more examples. Um, so um, the, with school schoolwork, for example, that would just mean um, that that would just mean like if a student wants to type up their book report in LibreOffice instead of Word, that um, that the school would then accept it in that format too, which the, the, the school wouldn't actually have to change anything on their own end since, um, yeah, the, the same pro programs can open it. It would just mean a change in policies. Um, so yeah, um, one thing I've been alerted to is that um, there is a new fiscal note online that does not match the one that is printed um, in the um, paper copy that was available at the um, on the table there. Um, I'd just like to note a few issues with it. Um, so it still has the old title of this bill on it. Um, it says an act prohibiting with limited exception state agencies from using proprietary software in interactions with the public. So yeah, that was the old title, but that was not what my intent was. I asked OLS to change it because that was a major sticking point of last year's bill was that the government can't just go and change all of the software. It uses itself that easily. So, um, yeah, um, I think that there has been kind of a misunderstanding here where, um, where the fiscal note is based on the idea that, um, the government would have to replace its own software, which, um, is not what this bill does. Um, it also mentions stuff about state websites. The uh, state websites part was a separate bill. Um, it was one of the previous bills um, that. Um, excuse me, could you just concentrate on this bill? Um, well, yeah, so I'm saying that the fiscal note here, I, I'm mentioning it because the fiscal note attached to this bill is referring to a previous bill that is not this bill. So um, I would just. Oh, thank you. The yeah. show, so we should not take it. We should take it with a grain of salt. Yes. Um, okay. So. Um, so, yeah, basically, yeah, just take the fiscal note with um, a grain of salt. Um, I have. So uh, I managed to uh, round up a few other free software supporters to come testify with me today so they can go more into depth on that. Um, but for now, um, I'll take any questions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Representative Lekas and then a bear. Thank you. So, uh, I need some help, you know, better understanding what you're trying to get at in this bill about, uh, so this is requiring people to run proprietary software. I, you, when we dealt earlier with JavaScript, are there any, applications that the state's requiring people, proprietary applications, the state's for people requiring people to run on their computers to access the websites, or are there others dealing with, uh, you know, document formats? I mean, are the schools literally requiring it be Word? I actually use LibreOffice, and I'm familiar with, yeah, yeah. it can generate PDF. So, you know, what, what are cases where you know that uh, the government is requiring people to run uh, proprietary applications on their computers well i mean i'm just remembering for when i was in school some teachers were very specific of you must submit in um a dot doc 
format and when when they were teaching um what yeah when, when they were teaching in the tech ed classes it was on how to use this proprietary software specifically which we were required to was yeah. part, was one of our requirements for something we had to take as part of our curriculum okay um follow up follow up yeah so, so i up. i mean some of those formats like dot doc LibreOffice will generate i believe uh, so will various other free or open software <laughs> so I'm, what i'm trying to understand is are there specific examples today where uh, interacting with the government requires you to run uh, proprietary software on your own system other than the JavaScript we dealt with earlier? Um, well, I think for when there is a remote attendance option for things, um, that remote attendance option is usually Zoom, which may be free cost-wise, but is still proprietary software. So um, I would think that in cases where, like, say, yeah, if you have to, if co the physical court is closed and you have to appear remotely, that there should be a free software um, alternative to Zoom that people can use to um, appear in court. Uh, one more follow-up? Follow-up. Okay, now that one actually, that makes sense. Are there any others that you're aware of? Um, well, those are the main ones I want to touch on myself. Um, I was talking with some of the other testifiers who are going to have their own examples. Um, so yeah, I'm, not, I'm going right, to try not you. to step on their toes. As much, that much. Representative Abear. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Gallagher, thank you very much for your testimony. If you could give us a few more examples, uh, my colleague, Representative Lekas, was just remarking, but if we could do uh, more of an understanding. So, Representative Abear, he said he doesn't have any more examples. He's waiting for the other people to testify. So, if you could defer your question. Thank you. Uh, is, Representative Dolan and Gerhard. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Chair. The, the the issue that that I'm concerned about is, is something like the state requires rooms and meals tax to be paid uh, by users of of that uh, of those utilities, and you have to you have to log on to the state system, the proprietary software that the state has in order to pay the rooms and meals tax. So how, what would this legislation do to people that, that want to log on and do and pay those, those, uh, those fees and would it require the state to uh, incur a lot more costs to be able to accommodate all kinds of, uh, individual software? Um, so I have not, uh, paid the rooms and meals tax myself personally so i'm not too familiar with um with the system that they use um but yeah um well yeah if it's a web-based interface then i think that would fit more under the one about javascript that um i introduced previously but if it's not a web-based interface, well, then I, I I guess I would need to look at that in more detail to be able to fully un, um, answer your question. Okay, okay thank you, Representative Bear. Thank you, Madam Chair. Regarding the language in here required to use proprietary software for any interaction with the government, in just playing off of this for one second, when you log your miles, when you walk in in the morning, would that include that you wouldn't have to do that? Um, so I, I, I think that the kiosks where uh, you log your miles should be built with um, free software. I think, yeah, I think that there should be an alternative. Um, like we were able to file mileage perfectly fine previously with um, a paper alternative. And um, 
So yeah, I think I think um, if um, yeah, if it's impossible, I, I, if it's impossible to provide a free software alternative to the mileage kiosk signings, then I think um, the solution should be to continue to provide a paper alternative. Thank you, Representative Lekas. Uh, thank you. Actually, that my I was making an assumption, maybe incorrect, and you can correct me. Oh, sorry. That, that this. That, I'm sorry. I missed Representative Gerhardt. Oh, no, okay. I, that um, that this was your concern, and what this bill was about was being required to run proprietary software on your own equipment, your yeah. phone, your computer, or whatever. Whereas the kiosk, that's not the case. So, I mean, if. My question is, if, if you view this as applying that expansively, would that also apply, let's say, to the uh, the parking meter things where you put your card or money in and you get a ticket to put on your on your car to indicate you paid it? Um, yeah, I, I, I guess that's a good point that um, I guess could use some... Um, let, let me look at the language um yeah I, I um i mean I, I i think um in the cases where it's not the user's own computer that that would fall um under the um exception for unless the agency has determined that proprietary software is the only means available um Right. Since yeah, that, that it's the only means available because they are the ones who put it there. So um, okay, thank you. Excuse me, Representative Gerhard, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. What your main motivation here is? It more concern about corporations, the tech corporations, or more concern about the government? Who are you worried about this information falling into the hands of exactly? Um. So. Well, it's it's kind of the overlap between the two that that's worrying um, going on here. Um, I th I think that the government should not be depending on private corporations um, to do its to function. Um, I think that it should be able to do its own business in a free and open manner that the citizens who uh, who control the government, you know, of, of the people, by the people, for the people, um, decide upon re um, rather than um, ra rather than having corporations make those decisions for the government. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you very much. All right, thank you. John Hall. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, Madam Chair. Uh, I look at this bill as an opportunity for people, citizens, to have access to the government in all forms. It is not to say what software the government should be using in their day-to-day -day and interactions with each other. I can give you a couple of examples. Public libraries oftentimes have computers in them for people that do not have access to the internet, do not have access to computers. They can go into the library, they can use a computer, perhaps to look for jobs, perhaps to interact with the government in some way, shape, or form. If you require these libraries to buy proprietary software, then that puts a fiscal issue for them, as well as a license management issue that typically doesn't happen when you use free software. So there is one example. To allow libraries to use so software and rely to standards, which we should be using anyway. Excuse me, sir. Yes? Libraries are not the subject of this bill. We're talking about state agencies. Yes, ma'am. 
Okay, so could if a library is not a state agency. That is true. Okay, thank you. However, the state, using software that forces a citizen to use proprietary software when their only access to it is through a public library, is a state problem. Ah, thank you. I'm glad I could clarify that. The other thing about this bill is a, a, an example of schools. So Hecan High School has kind of concentrated themselves on using Apple software and an Apple networking environment. If the school says, well, in order to go here, you have to buy an Apple computer because that interacts with it. And that keeps people from buying a Microsoft-based computer or keeps people from buying using free software in order to interact with the network. That is not also a good thing. Another example of this is, and, and, and what I would like to, to say too, especially with the fiscal impact statement of the online copy of this, th this is a bill that should be looking towards the future and not the past. So when you create a new RFP for a new software that you're gonna put as a state system, you should say in that RFP, that it needs to be able to operate with free software in the citizens' hands. And again, I'm not saying anything about the interactions of, of systems that are used by employees of the state. I'm talking about software that causes an interaction of a citizen with the state. I think that's about it. Thank you very much for listening to me. Okay. Oh, Thank one you. more thing. The fiscal impact of implementing this should be very minimal. I don't have any idea as to the numbers of systems that might be affected. However, when you go for an upgrade to that system or when you go for extending the licenses of those systems, you could make this a requirement of the company that produced that system. And that's what I think is most important. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Senator Bayer? I think my uh, guy who was testifying walked away. That's well, not peace. Oh, <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. That's okay. We're going to drag you back. Um, what I'm running through my mind, I'm I'm intrigued by this bill and interested, and I'm looking for some examples as I'm running this through my mind. Also, to make sure that we don't trip a wire by having something that closes a door on us either, right? Um, so I started to say like the the Zoom meetings, the Teams meeting, I, I've been in those situations where somebody sent you an invite and it's on, let's say it's on Teams. <sighs> I'm gonna have to log in, I gotta go figure out, I gotta go download the damn thing and then get get that going, right? So I get where we're going, but I'm looking for some some examples. So I'm thinking unemployment. Um, I'm thinking when I have to upload a picture of a certificate or something that it's, it's got to be in a JPG. I've got it in a PNG right. or IGS, right? Nope. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. So I was looking for some good, solid examples. Thank you. Sorry for the long question. Well, we'll take the first one. Uh, Jitsi is a piece of software that allows you to do a video conference, and it works under any W3C compliant browser. So you can do it on Edge, you can do it on, um, on uh, Firefox, you can do it on Chrome, and that would be an alternative to using Zoom. Um, you don't need to log in, you don't need to have an account, you can just fire it up. Um, so that would be one example. Uh, I have certain doctor's forms I work with that they don't accept a JPEG and they don't accept a PNG and they don't accept, you know, they only accept a PDF. That's fine because I know how to generate those, but it's often awkward because the input that I have is in that format. So, you know, again, we should be looking to be expansive and to try and take in as many types of things as possible as opposed to being restrictive. Did I answer your question? Okay. Any other questions?
I don't see any. Thank you, Representative Simon. Sorry, you said Jitsi. Is that correct? Jitsi. Can you yes. spell that for me? J I T S I. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Dennis Goddard. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Dennis Goddard. I live in Hopkinton. Um, I wanted to say just a couple of um, points related to the bill. I think it's already been noted that the, the fiscal note is probably way off base. Um, I, I would say what this bill is kind of asking for is an accessible entrance to a building for those of us that maybe don't want to use the normal one. Um, the bill for that work I would expect to be making an accessible entrance, maybe a ramp, maybe a doorknob. I, I wouldn't expect the bill to be, we have to replace the house, okay? You don't need a new building. Um, and so by that analogy, I wanna talk about what we're talking about here. Um, I, I'm one of the people that um, worked back in Silicon Valley during the late 90s and early aughts. Um, I'm one of the army of people that worked so damn hard during that time. Um, to make it possible to have the web that we now have. Um, for those who don't remember, there was a war. I mean, it was bad. It was brutal. Um, where some companies wanted to dictate exactly how the web was going to work and not necessarily publish the details. Um, and really what made the internet explode and happen and useful for everybody was that it's uh, what we call open standards. You could go to any place and read like an academic paper. Here's exactly how it's supposed to work. Here's my computer and the data it's going to send to you and your computer, the data we expect it to get back and the, the way to exchange the data. And it's all laid out and anyone can read it and write their own. And the idea was you make your own best implementation. You might have a proprietary server that's better, um, but you're talking the same language that anyone else can talk. That's how we made the internet where all our computers could talk together. Um, you, Y'all mostly will be familiar with HTML, which anyone can like look at HTML and like if you've done a little reading, you can understand there's books you can read or whatever you can look up. Okay, if I have an angle bracket and a B and then an end angle bracket, it means there's going to be bold. Okay, it's not like a secret. Um, one more example, just to make it a little more clear, I think for folks, most people are familiar with Microsoft Word, Microsoft Office. Um, Starting some years ago, you may have noticed that the extension changed when you save the file. Sometimes it used to be, say, a PPT file or a .doc file. Now you see it's a .pptx or a .docx, and you go, huh, whatever, seems to work. The X actually stands for XML, which is kind of like an HTML thing. Long and short of it is, it's an open standard. It's published, it's out there. Anyone that's like in the field can easily see, oh, okay, this is the format of the document. Here's how I read it. Here's what that stuff means. This is bold. This is italic. Here's a paragraph, et cetera. Uh, and that's what makes it possible for open source uh, code to do stuff like open Word documents, read them, and send you a Word document as far as you know. Yeah. And so, uh, again, what, this, what I read this bill as saying is what I think is motivating some of us to show up here today um, is that we're the sort of, honestly, conscientious objectors. Um, Look, I, I work in, in the, again, the IT field. I do a lot with security lately. I, I work at a very large database company, as it turns out, probably the kind of company that most of the people behind me do not want to do business with, but yet here I am earning a paycheck. Um, well, at least I'm not here earning a paycheck, but I mean, I, I'm employed there. But the point is, one thing I've learned keeping data safe is that the internet, and if there's one thing I, I want to impart to you today, it, whether it's open source or not, the internet is an adversarial environment. It's a war, and it has been for at least a decade. And it's not even two sides. It, it, it's not like um, I know good guys and bad guys. It's just an open chaos field. And it's nonstop, 24 seven. It's on every internet connected device that you own. Most of the time you don't see it because there's nothing that would show it to you because it's not gonna help you to see how many times you're trying to be hacked every day. Um, that's not so much the point. Well, the point is that those of us who are really involved with, with, with this stuff tend to be those who are most concerned. Um, I, again, being involved very deeply in, in the space of large data, um, I, I don't use Windows at home. <laughs> no way. Uh, my employer gives me a phone 
um, that they have their proprietary software on so I can, you know, work remotely and stuff. But my personal phone uh, is neither uh, Google nor Apple. Thank you very much. It's an open hardware and open source phone uh, with switches on it that I can flick that say, like, it's physically disconnected. The camera's not on. Um, you know, I realize that's not everybody. And certainly those of us in a weird little, I'll call it religious minority for the sake of a better term. And, and I want to come back to that momentarily. Um, we're not trying to make everyone comport to our particular weirdness. Um, but I do think that it's fairly well established in the way that we want to have our civil society, um, that there are rights of conscience that are really at the base, e even of the um, religious freedoms that um, those in the faith-based community enjoy. They're, they're all based on these rights of conscience, um, not all of which are specifically about um, faith. We have also bits in our constitution about things like those who are really scrupulous in avoiding the use of weapons, not being conscripted um, in, in a war. I use that war analogy for a reason. Um, I'm very scrupulous in my personal life. I, I know some people aren't, you know, we're the Quakers, it's cool, you don't have to come to our meetings. Um, but I, I don't use this stuff. I don't want to. I understand how big the machine is and, and how little it's in control and how little faith I have that any government is going to get it under control. How little, uh, how much I know how many governments uh, and uh, or, uh, companies are far too involved in each other. So here, here's what I want to leave you with. Um, what we're asking for is just to make sure that when government puts something up, and it, it doesn't have to retroactively immediately be everything that we've ever done, but like, can we let towns know? Can we let the state government know? You're, you're about to roll some, out some piece of whatever. Um, make sure it's open standards, right? If you're going to stream something, and maybe you feel it necessary to stream it, you know, look at open source options if they're available at all. Don't, don't make us use them. Um, you know, sometimes there's, there's cheap ways to do stuff. Like you want to stream stuff on YouTube and it's really easy for most people. There, there are little things you can do. I, I personally set up what's called an invidious instance for my, uh, family and friends, um, that lets me use YouTube without YouTube collecting the data of those who use YouTube. Um, again, it, it's really not about finding every piece of proprietary software and getting rid of it. It's just making sure that government doesn't require me as, as a taxpayer, as a user, to install some piece of software, use some piece of software that was created by uh, an organization that won't show me the source code or doesn't publish it, its interfaces so, so that others um, can, can play in the same space. Um, that, that's why, uh, one last thing, I'm sorry, web browsers. Web browsers. This, this was the whole war I was talking about in the 90s and, and early aughts. Um, the reason that it doesn't matter what web browser you use when you go to any website, that was a big thing. I don't know if you remember, there was a little icon you'd see on some websites, like this site best viewed in any browser, because at the time, Microsoft really wanted you to use the Microsoft um, Internet Explorer browser that they actually just got, that they just desupported, which is one of the reasons that some of us are really concerned about these things. Open standards don't go away because some company isn't finding them profitable anymore. Um, so yeah, please don't take this to be you have to get rid of the whole house. Please take this to be, for those of us who are really scrupulous about these things, we'd like an alternate entrance or maybe the default entrance to be one that everyone can use with, where the standards are open and, and published. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Representative Gerhardt? Thank you, Madam Chair. My, my own twin brother was in the military, and he was saying actually the government runs Linux on the computers that control the missiles because he was over in Hungary messing with that. So I understand the concept, and personally, I use Linux myself on home and Lineage on some of my cell phones. But what I'm concerned about is somebody that is also on the committee that was talking about the fact there's no, there's no support or upkeep or upgrades to this open source software. How do you deal with that? So the state says we're going to have this system doing this. All of a sudden, you guys get bored, you move on to a new project, nobody's upkeeping the thing. What do we do? I, I mentioned that my company is responsible for some of the largest databases in the world, the ones that have all of your cell phone records, all of your financial records. Um, the big companies choose our database to store your stuff in, and they store their stuff on Linux servers, most of them, most of them. And my team 
are 24 seven around the clock in some uh, time zone, it's, it's noon somewhere. Um, and they're helping our customers fix any problem they have. Uh, in, in short, the assertion that there isn't support is in fact a not correct one. There are many, 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 in fact, there is a diversity um, of consultancies that are more than willing to provide support to open source software and that diversity and, and ecosystem and dare I say, capitalist um, incentive is there because uh, the standards are open and uh, people can compete on providing good service at a good price. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Representative Lackus. Thank you. Hey, Dennis, good to see you again. Uh, I understand the philosophical or, or as you put it, religious view and I'm sort of part of that religion, although probably not as orthodox um, as you, but to help us with this bill, I mean, statute has to be pretty specific. We can't, we're not generally writing general philosophy. So it's kind of related to the questions I asked before. Um, um, we had the example of Zoom, we had the example of schools maybe requiring certain hardware, I get that. Um, but some of these uh, formats, at this point, I don't know of any that you know, open source software won't generate as far as uploading documents. For example, I'm looking for, and this also is to help us make some assessment of the fiscal note, if it makes any sense. And so the question is, what examples are there where people are required to use uh, proprietary software to interact with the state government? Sure. Um, you, you've opened a, a very easy and interesting one. Um, you know, my children had to use Zoom uh, in, in their schools. I wasn't thrilled about it, but there you go. Um, I fear a time when my, uh, whether it's my town or the state of New Hampshire tells me that um, to either pay a tax or pay a ticket or pay for the parking, whatever, that I can download an app that works in either Apple or iOS. Uh, um, I, it's almost like being able to vote both Republican and Democrat and asking why there's any problem. Um, but I definitely hear the concern. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I'm very grateful that you guys are professional at the use of language to craft um, desired policy outcome because I, I'm not sure how to go about doing so. Um, in a way, I want examples, um, but in a way, you know, um, but, but I hear the need for specificity. Um, so I, I think that there clearly needs to be some language to clarify things for the, the general audience and for the, um, for the organizations and state organizations that will have to determine whether they're compliant or what they have to do. Um, my, my personal opinion is that there ought to be a study committee, frankly, um, but uh, I'm, I'm not a legislator. But I, I, I will say I could tell your lack of orthodoxy um, right away just from the general position. Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if we can, if whatever happens to this bill, I'll be glad to work with you and, and Rep Gallagher to maybe talk about options and get ideas. Anyway, thank you. Okay. President Dolan and the neighbor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I as uh, I, I'm concerned about cost of government. And so my question is, I go back to the, what I raised earlier about interfacing with the, with the proprietary software that the state has to pay your rooms and meals tax. It's not hard to, to consider that if I just tore off a piece of paper and said, I don't want to interface with your software, so I'm going to just submit a piece of paper with my hand scratch on it that it would cost the government a lot more money to process that piece of paper than to uh, allow the, or to, to ha have the individual put the, the information into the, to the proprietary software. What do, what do we do in, 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 uh, in that case, in, in a situation, how do we prevent the cost of government growing in order to accommodate what's being suggested? Sure. Thank you for the question. And as a person who might, you know, one of the teams, my team, and sometimes I have to do is we, we actually process tickets. They're, they're not for parking fines that someone has a problem and there's a ticket and it comes to us. And the ones that cost us the most are those weird one-off ones, right? If, if there was a standardization, we could process 10,000 times the amount, but like it's the weird one-offs that cost you, right? So I very much hear what you're saying about the guy with the strange request in the torn off piece of paper. Um, fortunately, I think like, like all analogies, this one breaks down at a certain point. Um, 
I think the key here is not necessarily to say that anyone can use any method that they want to use any branch of government. I mean, we're not saying you can come in and speak Swahili for some purpose and ex expect that the person behind the counter is going to have to help you. Um, but rather that when government is setting up these interfaces or, or setting up these systems, um, typically it's not at all a, uh, uh, a confusing or a shades of gray kind of thing. Typically you've either got a system that, uh, Oh, good luck. Thank you. Uh, a checkbox that a provider or a, a company will say is, well, you know, it conforms to, you know, whatever open standard, SSL v3 or HTML5, et cetera. Um, which is why, for example, right, our, our state government, last I checked, uh, we were using IIS uh, information server, Microsoft's web server for a lot of things. I don't have to use Microsoft in my browser because we're talking this common HTML language. Um, and so I'm, we're not saying that we can literally go in and say, I, I want to speak a different language. But that as long as your browser is set up so that HTML is the lingua franca and it's the published HTML that we all mean when we say HTML, then, then there's no issue. Uh, as opposed to, well, you have to use the Microsoft browser to go to this web page because that's the deal. That's Representative Bear. Thank you, Madam Chair. So back to your original opening comment about we want to replace the door, not the building analogy. Would it behoove us to have the bill state something that all new systems and renovated systems would be certified through our IT officer also sitting in the panel here today to ensure that it's open source? Would that cover us? Thank you. Uh Thank you for the question. I, I think that would go, I, I would love that. I think it would go a little farther than I require. I think a, a very central piece of, of my personal religion is I never turn down a small piece of cake. Um, so um, if, if language is amended so that um, open source should be you know, considered for any new systems, that's great. Um, and again, I, I think an important part of, of this resubmit is that it doesn't mandate that the sort that the state use open source. It could very well be a closed source, fully proprietary, you know, owned and maintained by Microsoft or whoever, um, but that those interfaces to the public, that those be um, open standards, open published standards. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Christopher Wade. All right. Um, so let me give me a so I'm, I'm Christopher Wade uh, from Keene, New Hampshire. Um, I, I own a small, well, fairly small business um, that uh, basically we sell hardware and I'm in the free software. Uh, I do free software development um, and I fund free software development. Um, There's a little bit, a little bit about me. Um, so I, I probably have the most expertise in terms of uh, dealing with non-technical users and free software systems um, as my company is the, the leading the leading retailer of computers basically uh, to the world effectively um, and accessories for that matter um, so uh, one of the things I want to make a few comments on what is actually if you're gonna if you're going to have something amended or changed here, um, it doesn't. It's not necessarily as far as this bill is concerned that everything be open source or free software. Um, what matters is actually that the formats and the APIs uh, be open, such that users can interact with the government um, and ensure that the users can interact. All users can interact with the government. So, um, so this is this is. I want to talk a little bit about the costs here real quick. So this isn't really any different than what's already uh, already available. The government's already doing in terms of accommodating people with disabilities. Um, you know, if, if there's a program to say, for example, submit, and I don't know enough about this specifically, but submit uh, rooms and meals tax to the government, they already are going to have to offer something for somebody who's disabled. So this is not this shouldn't really have any substantial costs. Uh, it, all it does is effectively apply this, what, what people with disabilities have already got to everybody. Um, 
So um, one of the things about people were talking about security. So is it the security thing, the only people who are saying that there's like an issue there, I think, are people who don't understand free software and how it's developed. So Canonical and IBM are basically two companies that put out the leading enterprise uh, distribution. There's some others, but leading enterprise distributions for, for Linux and free software and GNU. And basically uh, the, way, the way it works in the free software world is there are these basically companies or distributions and they maintain the software. So you get security updates. You can get 10 to 12 years of security updates for basically almost any application that you would want to run on your system. And this doesn't matter if it's your web browser, like Firefox or, you know, Apache web server or whatever. Um, so it's not, it's not really, it's not like in windows where it is the other thing. It's not like in, in windows or with Apple, you know, if Apple or Microsoft discontinue something, you know, you're, that's it. There's nothing you can do about it. If I'm if I am looking at options, this is one of the great things about the free market and free software is there's actually competition in the market. So if I'm looking at I don't know, let's I'm trying to think of another example. Debian. Debian uh, is they've got sort of official support maintained for five years with their distribution. Well, their distribution has the, most of the same software that IBM's distribution and Canonical's distribution have. Um, but the difference is their support, the, how long that support lasts for security updates is different. So if you need something that's a long-term supported distribution, you'd wanna look at Canonical, or if you even need longer support, you'd wanna look at something like Red Hat Enterprise Linux from IBM. All right. Um, so my main concern though here today is actually uh, non-technical users. It's usually non-technical users who get stumped by, you know, issues when it comes to interfacing with governments and schools and things like that. Um, basically what this would do is it would just make it easier for people to, uh, when, when problems occurred, uh, it makes it easier for somebody to say, hey, wait a minute, Teach, you got to give me uh, another way to submit my 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 paper that I might have to submit. Maybe that's on, maybe physically hand them a paper or, um, you know, submit it in an ODT file. It doesn't actually, the bill doesn't, it's it's saying mandate, right? They can't mandate the use of proprietary software. So that doesn't mean, you know, that doesn't mean it even has to be. It just means there has to be, they have to offer you another option if you have an issue. Um, So one of the other things is without, it's important for security from like an end user standpoint uh, that their source is available. And it, you know, a lot of people here are talking about it from a, like a technical standpoint, but this is actually more concerning to me from an end user standpoint, because unless free software developers can look at the source code and not just the people who wrote it, you can't really even begin to have a conversation about security. Um, and you can't begin to have a secure system. One of the things you'll never hear is a GNU Linux user saying, oh, I was infected by, you know, malware X or, you know, virus X. You, you just, you can't get infected when the distribution, when you have a distribution and you've kept your security updates up to date, there is no antivirus for Linux, except for antivirus that scans for Windows viruses. Um, and this is something I, I think people fail to understand about security, like the general population. It's, it's, it's because the way proprietary software is developed that we have security issues. It's not that there aren't bugs in free software. There are, but they're fixed and they can be fixed. And there's competition in the market that ensures those security issues get resolved immediately so they can't be exploited. Excuse right. me, sir. I think yep. you're you're drifting from the bill in question. Could you uh, wrap it up? All the points I've made were specifically related to what we've talked about um, that were asked questions. Um, so uh, the other thing I want to point out is that proprietary software is actually already undermining people's with people with disabilities access to government services. Um, and just as an example. Um, so I'm actually going to give you an example uh, for people who are getting like welfare and things like that, um, that people wanted an example of where this actually hinders people today. Um, and that is with what, well, well, welfare, basically, I'm, I'm not sure exactly if it's true at the state level or not, but I know, I believe it's at least at the federal level. Um, there are some benefits and I, I'm not sure specifically welfare specifically, it might be more like social security, but there are certain things that you have to fill out and it has to be with Adobe reader. It cannot be with a free PDF reader. Um, so that's, that's a good example. Um, court ordering monitoring software is another uh, good example. And again, I, I'm not, I'm not that familiar with state 
New Hampshire specifically, I only know people who have had this happen at the federal level, but it's not unlikely that there's state, uh, there's something uh, state level equivalent of uh, monitoring software. Um, devices like parking meters are often mechanical, not, and they're not dependent on software. So it's not actually a, a software problem in most cases. Um, and this bill probably would have no effect on it as far as I can see. Um, So another example of where government forces users to run proprietary software on their own computer is submitting documents pertaining to benefit. Oh, well, I already said that. Um, okay. Something else that's important to note is a end user license agreement is something that you agree to simply by the using the software. Um, it's really messed up that a government can tell you that you have to agree to Microsoft's terms in order to use Microsoft Word or Microsoft Windows or anything like that. Um, you're you're effectively forcing somebody to agree to a contract that that they don't necessarily agree to. Um, I'm not even sure how that that's legal, but anyway, um, yeah. So that's that's what I have to say on that. If anybody has any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Representative Gerhard. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. You said that there are free market pressures on open source developers to maintain their software and to keep it free. What? Yeah. When I when I downloaded Linux, it was free. So what free market? What? Where's the motive? Oh yeah. So yeah, it's pretty simple. Um, so there's competition in the marketplace. There's different versions of Linux, and it may be that your version of Linux. I don't know what do you do. You know what you do? You know what you what Current, you download? Currently, Cinnamon. Okay, Linux Mint, I'm assuming. Um, so Linux Mint has support for three to five years, basically. You're not gonna get security updates for more than five years. You have to move off of it after five years. If you want uh, if you want to have security updates for say, you know, 10 years or 12 years, you would have to use something like Red Hat Enterprise Linux or um, uh, I'm trying to think some of the others. Uh, 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 Ubuntu. Uh, well, well, That's fine. I just one follow up and then uh, thank you. Quick and, and those yeah. are commercial services that they're offering you. Understood. But and that's what are the those made. those those latter commercial services that you're talking about are those are those open source themselves? Yeah. I just don't see how you can sell something when it's open source. The information's out there. But okay. Um, so you, anyway, I'm good. I'm good. Okay, we'll you talk. could buy all the parts for a car and build it yourself, or you could pay somebody for a whole car. Okay. Thank Thank you very much. I don't see any other questions. Ben Callis. Thank you. So I am Ben. I'm a computer science PhD student at Dartmouth College. Uh, and my area of research is cybersecurity. Uh, with free software, you can see how it works. And with proprietary software, you can't. So that's like not being able to pop the hood of your car. Uh, so with Zoom, uh, they've had a really bad privacy and security track record. Uh, they claimed to use end-to-end -end encryption, and then it turned out that they were lying about that, uh, and that really they meant there's only encryption between the users and Zoom's servers, which is employed almost, almost every web service works that way. So that's like every scam on the internet is end-to-end -end encrypted, if that's your definition of end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, free software doesn't have this issue because public code can be independently verified. So that's why I think I should not be made to use proprietary software in my interactions with the government. Thank you. That's well stated. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Dennis Goulet. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, I am Dennis Goulet. I'm the Commissioner for the Department of Information Technology, um, which is responsible for IT for the executive branch uh, of government in New Hampshire. Um, first of all, I, I want to start out with a little scope, because um, you know there's been some questions on um, the fiscal note and how it was developed and whether it's accurate or not. So I want to touch on that a little bit. Um, Basically, um, what I'm, you know, one of the implications was the um, that the um, there was some confusion relative to the websites and the, and applications that are public facing. So I want to touch on that just for a minute. 
It turns out that um, I didn't consider our websites in scope for either this bill or House Bill 327, which is a JavaScript bill, because we're running, we're presently running 96 um, uh, executive branch websites, um, and most of those have already been moved over to our new platform, which is actually running in open source and, and, and didn't have the JavaScript problem, nor, nor do we consider it, uh, we consider it um, compliant with the language of this bill. So there's no website work that, that we considered having to be funded or done because we're already doing that work on an existing project that's moving all the executive branch websites into the Drupal platform uh, managed by Acquia f on our behalf. So um, I, I consider that um, something that I didn't include in the scope of either of those bills. And um, what we did include, though, is we looked at how many applications we had in the executive branch of government, which was, um, actually, I'm looking it up now. Uh, we had 670 executive branch applications that we looked at. Um, these, are, these are not little things. We, we kind of made sure it was bigger than a bread box before we considered it. And of two, 271 of those are public facing. And then we said, um, you know, you have to make assumptions on a, a fiscal note like this. So we, we made an assumption that we would have to address 90% of those. So, um, so that's, you know, and then we looked at, uh, broke up the applications into small, medium, large, and extra large. And uh, you may recall that it was a range of costs in, in House Bill 327. We put a single cost per application size in this bill because we actually have a lot of recent experience acquiring applications. So we had a decent idea of how much uh, it would cost to implement an app. For example, the uh, Department of Revenue, uh, their new revenue information system, which is spe specifically called out in this language, cost uh, a little over $30 million to implement over a three-year period. So. So we had some reasonable good numbers. Um, so I would submit that neither did I misunderstand, nor is the, the fiscal note um, far off. Um, I'd also like to address the, the concept of doing it all now versus doing it incrementally going forward, uh, which you know, certainly would be the right way to do any large change like that we're considering here. Um, one of the factors is, and, and we talked about this before, was there's, you know, state government applications are very specific. There isn't a huge market out there for the, a lot of these 271 apps are very unique to that particular thing that we're doing. So when we go out and acquire there, are a lot of times there are niche companies who are developing. It's like the revenue system, for example. It's a niche company. They do revenue and they do driver's license. That's all they do. There's no open source alternative for that. So what we would, uh, my assumptions under the fiscal note, and those would apply whether we did it, you know, set up over a five-year plan to ch turn everything over, or we just did everything upon reacquiring or rebidding, is that we would have to develop in an open source context most of the apps we were acquiring if we did require that we use open source for that. So we'd create an open source info ecosystem. We would have to hire developers or contract with developers to do that, and we'd operate in that manner. Um, so that those were the assumptions in my bill. And you know, I would stand by the, the, co the cost, whether it was compressed into a five-year period or done over a 30-year period. It would be very expensive um, to, to do this. Um, now, I'd like to address, you know, we actually do consider open source every time we're, we're looking at something. In fact, uh, um, I just gave an example of our websites when we went out and said, all right, we need a platform to develop and host our web stuff. We picked Drupal because it was a really great alternative. There were companies out there that would help us manage it. So I could, you know, that was 96 websites. I support them with three people three people in my staff. So it's a pretty efficient setup with that. So that's working well. Uh, we have over a thousand Linux servers running um, almost all of our major state applications, including the, uh, including the el uh, integrated eligibility system that HHS operates called New Heights that has a citizen facing component, which is called New Hampshire Easy. Um, you know, so we're, our um, learning management system is open source. So. When there's a good alternative that already exists, you know, I'm all for it. Um, what the reason I'm opposed to um, the language of the bill and and focusing simply on open source is it's it's just not practical. We would have to the time to value for new applications if we have to develop them 
versus you know purchase an 85 or 90 percent solution off the shelf is you know is too far out it actually would constrain our ability to improve citizen service and uh, again we'd have to be contracting with with more developers than we do today that concludes my formal testimony representative Broda. thank you i'm sorry i don't have the fiscal note so can you tell me the cost on the fiscal note uh let's see let me look at that hang on i don't need that uh, right now I think it was um, I, I had um, put it at it's about th a little over 320 million for each year 24 25 and 26 that's assuming we would tur turn over those 271 applications in five years so I actually if you look at my original um, the worksheet that I did for myself it's a five-year plan very tight five-year plan that would be you know that about a little over 320 320 million per year thank, thank you. you representative Lekas. yeah just uh so i understand the assumptions you made concerning the, or interpretation of this when you did the fiscal note were you assuming that this would require that any public facing application would have to have zero proprietary software in it um, I assume 90% of those public facing applications, not websites, would, right. would have no, no propriety. In other words, you know, I, I considered we'd have to create an open source um, entity inside the state and operate that. And, you know, because there, there isn't such a thing existing today. And then our, and, and our, anybody we contracted with or our own developers would have to operate in that context. To follow up, follow up. Just, just to clarify, when you said 90%, I mean, you'd, you'd have to get it down to the point where no more than 10% was proprietary, or you're saying there's some percentage I, now? Or? Well, I, I was interpreting, you know, this is an assumption I made, which I could be incorrect, but I said the, the language of the bill said, um, you know, all but a very few. Oh. So I just said, all right, 90%. You know, we could say 95, we could say 85, you know. I, you know I'm, all right, thank you. Yeah. Okay, we're going to hard in the neighbor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would this be considered a very labor-intensive activity, more so than physical infrastructure, or what would be the main cost here? Well, um, well <clears throat> the, um, the the biggest cost, I think, would be there's two you know two two costs. Free software isn't free. Um, in fact, when I pay for software, the largest um, cost isn't the actually the acquisition of the software; it's the implementation of the software, and that would be true for open source as well. So, if if you say I want to change from system A to system B. Even, even if I'm not paying for the software for system B, there's a large cost of, ch of turning over both opportunity costs inside the organization, i.e. taking work away from doing your day job and, and, and mm -hmm. moving that system, as well as you know any services you might need, wraparound services to get that done. Thank you, just follow up. Follow up, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. My, my question is more concerning there seems to be an activist community that's very concerned about this. Mm -hmm. Would there be any way for these activists to be active in actually implementing this and then cutting the state's cost in it? Or is this sensitive data that's whatever? Well, it, it, it absolutely is. In fact, um, a lot of my roles require, um, you know, in fact, when I, if I bring on new employees, uh, depending on where they're working, there's certain, you know, hoops we have to jump through before I can even hire them because of the type of data that's being used, most particularly in revenue and Department of Safety. Representative Abraham. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a question for you. Are we continuing this later? Is it, it Does it go to executive? Does it go to subcommittee? Uh, obviously, there's so many more questions. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think we should consider this a graduate course in, in, in software, but um, we'll, we'll I don't think we'll be executing it right away. Uh, Mr. Goulet, I have a question. As I am not a software engineer, so first, but as I read the bill, it simply says that if I'm on my computer using Linux and OpenOffice or whatever, can I access these systems? And I have to say that I have been able to, for example, file my interest and dividends tax without using proprietary software. And I'm sure that their system is. So what is 
Isn't yeah. it only the interface that this bill affects? Well, it, or am as, I confused? Well, I, I think as written, it's more expansive. Um, but um, you know, certainly we do. It's cer certainly not our intent to require people to use open source software. Sometimes I think that. Uh, it, there may be applications we have, particularly older ones, because we have applications, everything from brand new right now to 35 years old. And, and what we're seeing is the ones, the older ones tend to be more restrictive because technology wasn't as good 35 years ago as it is today at, at being right. kind of interoperating. Um, so, but I, it, it I certainly- it, but it, doesn't, it, it, I mean, when you were talking about having a open source environment, I mean, wouldn't you be able to check it out by using an open source web browser and say, can I can I do what I need to do on this software, regardless of what's inside the black box? Yeah, it, it, and that would be an about. I think that would be a piece. But that particular evaluation would be a, a bit by bit on the 271 apps as we reprocure them if we chose to go forward that way. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Representative Gould. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hello. Hi. Uh, and thank you for taking my question. So I just want to ensure that the 300 million, is that what the figure was you gave? Three, th 320, and uh, that was formulaically done, and I'd be happy to take anybody that desires to go through my, my, <laughs> my model through it in detail. Yeah, yeah, no, I trust you in terms of the scope you were talking about. So as I, and thank you, Madam Chair, for your question. That was my question. As I understand it, what we're talking about is going forward, ensuring that any new programs that are developed will accept open source created documents, formats. Would that reduce the $300 million costs uh -huh. to put that clause in your bids for software development in the future? It, that, that's, a, that's a completely different animal in my, in my estimation. It, it would... Um, it would cause a reevaluation, and and we'd have to look at what the specific language was. But um, because the we're always looking for a um, eighty-five or ninety percent solution to get to that mm -hmm. hundred is a lot more expensive than the eighty-five or ninety. And um, when we're talking about um, okay, we're going to have systems that are, will accept any kind of document format, things like that. That, that adds quite a bit of complexity, potentially, in some cases. Um, and, and I think we'd have to look at that at every single system. For example, if I go out and procure um, a system to do case management, for example, for an HHS use case, um, we certainly are um, looking to be able to accept any document formats that are generally being used out there. Mm -hmm. Would that exclude some particular document formats? It may. Um, so again, just you know, a lot of application developers look at, all right, what is, for example, web browser? I heard the web browser example, which is a really good one. Um, generally, what we look at is, all right, what's the market share out there for any for for and, and take the highest, you know, take the um, high end of the market share. What are people actually using and addressing? You know, that that'll typically get most people happy. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you. I think we will not vote on this at the moment. We're too confused. And I'll close. Does anyone else wish to testify on House Bill 617? Right, seeing none, I will close the hearing and open the hearing on House Bill 284. And I presume Representative Aaron wants to speak. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for uh, having me come and introduce this bill. I'm here today. Um, I'm Representative Judy Aaron representing 
Sullivan County District 4, the towns of Ackworth, Goshen, Langdon, Lempster, and Washington. And I'm here today to introduce HB 284. This bill modifies and clarifies what is prohibited from being made available to the public regarding information relative to RFBs, requests for bids, RFPs, requests for proposals, or RFAs, uh, cancellations, requests for applications. Constituents of mine have been having difficulty getting basic information about these cancellations. And agencies are not answering any questions about RFB, RFP, and RFAs in general. <clears throat> Excuse me. This bill seeks to clarify that basic questions can be answered. I had this happen to me as well when I was seeking information about an RFP regarding broadband expansion, the agency handling the RFP would not give me any information about the bidding process or status or when a decision was going to be made regarding a broadband granting process. My bill inserts new language to the RSA stating that it is okay to provide information about an RFP, RFB, or RFA determination um, cancellation or non-selection as long as it isn't information related to other bids or other bidders. For far too long, agencies have avoided giving out any information to bidders about or, in, or the public about any cancellation process or status of a bid by hiding behind parts of this statute, which is RSA 21-G colon 37. Clarification is therefore needed because state agencies most likely misinterpret this RSA or merely use it as a reason not to answer questions at all. Examples of questions that have been denied based on this RSA include questions about when in an award might be made, the reasons why a solicitation was canceled, if a new solicitation might be reissued later on, etc. So when a bidder asks for simple and basic information, they are met with the phrase, quote, state law restricts us from commenting on any canceled solicitations. And they are quoted the link to the RSA 21-G colon 37. So for instance, the following questions can never get a response. What's the timeline or status of this RFP? Why was this RFP canceled? What happens to the funding for this RFP now that this RFP is canceled? What are the future plans for this RFP? And will they plan to reopen it again at another time? Do we have to resubmit the application if the RFP is reinstated? Will my application be automatically resubmitted if this RFP is reinstated? So none of those kinds of questions are being answered. They're all saying, well, we can't give you any information. So these questions have nothing to do with other bids or other bidders, and they don't give anyone an unfair advantage in the bidding process to the questioner. So why is this information being prohibited from being provided by the agency to the bidder asking the questions? My new language changes this and allows for basic information about the process, plans, and status of an RFP, RFB, or RFA so that the bidder can at least get an idea of where the process is and what the agency is planning for this RFP, RFB, or RFA. This assists the bidder to plan accordingly or at least know what is going on. I also added a section to the statute that inserts the following new paragraph. Quote, nothing in this chapter shall be construed as a justification to avoid answering questions posed by the public or members of the general court that are unrelated to information regarding other bids or bidders to an RFB, RFP, RFA, or similar submission. And this further clarifies that an agency cannot use this statute as justification to not answer questions unrelated to other bids or bidders. I believe that in the interest of common sense and government transparency, that these changes need to be made to this RSA, and I hope that you will agree and support this change to this statute. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Representative Gerhard, yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. As far as chapter, I mean, um, section eight, nothing in the chapter shall be construed as justification. The last part, what is the penalty if they do not disclose? Is this under the Privacy Act or? 
I don't believe there's any penalty that I'm aware of. So you're asking them to release information they haven't been releasing so far? Um, well, they, they should be releasing this information because it doesn't, it doesn't have anything to do with giving anybody an unfair advantage. Follow up. I agree with you. What I'm just getting at is generally government doesn't do something unless they're forced to do it. So, I mean, asking seems like it's not going to get anywhere since we've been doing, you've been doing that so far and haven't gotten anywhere. Mm. That's what I'm concerned about. I so, got, I got thank you. you. Yeah. That will happen, Representative O'Brien. Thank you, uh, Madam Clerk, and thank you, Representative, for taking my question. For my clarity, what is the difference between your bill and the right to know law? Not sure. Um, I don't know. I don't know if uh, right to know comes into play with any of this. Uh, it probably should, but uh, clearly, what these agencies are doing are not answering basic questions and saying that statute prohibits them from answering those questions. Uh, so we're trying to clear up the statute so that they can see that they're they're not. Uh, violating anything by giving basic information. The um, if looking at the statute you gave us, it says notwithstanding the provisions of RSA 91A. So they're they're saying the the bidding process is not open to 91A. Essentially, that it's protected. Okay, I understand. So evidently, so and her bill says. Well, but you can still tell these pieces of it to, to people. That I would imagine the people who wrote RSA 91A had this intention in mind when they when they scribed it. But that's debatable and executive. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Thank you very okay. much, Representative Thank you. Barron. And I have copies of my testimony, so I'll pass them along. Thank you. Uh, Derek Furland? Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and ladies and gentlemen of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Derek Furlan. I'm the uh, county manager for Sullivan County. I'm here to testify uh, in support of House Bill 284 and the amendment. Uh, but my testimony today is confined to the original uh, scope of House Bill 284 as it was uh, drafted. Uh, at the risk of reiterating much of what the bill sponsor, Representative Aaron, said, I just wanted to share a little bit of additional background. Um, which led to the crafting of the, of the bill. Um, it's an experience that I had in actually working with executive departments on various matters. Uh, the RGA, the request for grant application process, uh, which is covered in part by uh, RSA 21G37. Um, and I'll get to the specifics of, of, uh, of what I experienced shortly. Um, as uh, Representative Aaron mentioned, this bill makes very small, but I think there are critical uh, tweaks to this bill language um, or to the RSA. Uh, I think if I were to infer legislative intent, I could say from my personal experience that the way uh, RSA 21G37 is being used is it's actually being misunderstood and, and therefore misused by some members of, of the executive departments. Um, just simply, if and I included in, in the handout, uh, as well as uh, the, the, my cover letter with an attachment, I've actually got the, the bill text. I wasn't sure if you all had that readily available. So I highlighted two sections that I think really speak to the confusion that's caused by the lack of this uh, added bit of clarity. Um, first of all, I'll start with just the title, uh, Financial Information Regarding Requests for Bids and Proposals. So I think that does set the tone for what the legislative intent was behind this law 
uh, it's, it's, I think, regarding specific financial information. Um, and right in paragraph one, uh, the highlighted part begins with concerning specific responses to requests for bids, requests for proposals, and requests for applications. Uh, if you look at page two, um, paragraph six talks about when an agency cancels uh, one of these solicitations. And then it simply says, no information other than a notification of the cancellation shall be available to the public, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where, I think that's where the disconnect is because in section one, in following on with the title of the, of the RSA, it's very clear that this should be confined to specific responses, which makes perfect sense. If you're a contractor and you've submitted uh, a paving project to DOT, you shouldn't go in and be able to see what company A, B, or C uh, did for their bid. That would be an unfair uh, competitive uh, disadvantage for, for those bidders. But as Representative Aaron said, uh, when the questions are, hey, when's the scoring going to uh, happen? Those are purely procedural process-related questions that have absolutely nothing to do with any particular submittal. Uh, and yet the response typically is, sorry, under RSA 21G37, I can't tell you anything. And I can just tell you, uh, when you're working on a grant application, it's generally tied, um, in the case of Sullivan County, our funding stacks tend to be pretty complex because we don't have any money. So we have to seek multiple sources. And so the timeline of when those sources actually you get approved or not, they really matter. Um, so when you're trying to put together a project that's reliant on various uh, sources of grant funding, you know, those are, that's a basic premise that's very, very important. Um, so if you refer to the second page of, of my submittal, this is just a quick summary of, a, of the timeline of, I think, the most recent time that I ran into this. It was a couple years ago, um, shortly after COVID started. So you can just see in um, entry number one in April, the, the RGA uh, was, was due, the submittals were due. And so a little over a month later, I just emailed and said, hey, I was just looking for an update. Um, about a week later, I got the response, cannot provide any, inf any information. Uh, during a procurement in accordance with RSA 21G37. Um, and then if you skip down to uh, entry number eight, and this was in January 8th of 2021, so almost a year later, um, I found out that the, the RGA was canceled. And so those are the actual questions uh, that I asked. Why was it canceled? What will happen with the funding? Will there be another RFP or RGA issued later in the year? Um, and if the answer is yes, will those uh, applications roll over automatically? So again, nothing to do with any other um, solicitation or submittal, and certainly nothing that would delve into the financial particulars uh, of, of any of those submittals. And so the last entry, number nine, is, is again verbatim the response that I got. And just, uh, just to note some of the blanks, um, I took the liberty of just sanitizing this because I'm not. My intent here is not to throw a particular department under the bus and embarrass anybody. I just think it's a systemic problem that really gets back to the lack of clarity of Section Six. And so I don't cast any aspersions on a particular staff member. I just think it's just a little bit of um, the lack of clarity leads to the misunderstanding. So I think uh, that concludes. My, my, my testimony, I just wanted to give a bit of uh, additional information to show how this RSA is implemented in, in practice using a real world example. Um, and I think this, this minor tweak will, will go a long ways towards helping provide better guidance maybe for the executive department so that they can be more responsive and provide information when it's completely unrelated to any other specific uh, bids or the financial information contained therein. Thank you very much, pending your questions. Representative Fitzpatrick. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think I understand it now. So I'm just gonna give you a scenario and see if, if this is exactly where you're going with this. You wanna pave 10 miles worth of, worth of roads. You put it up to a bid. The, the bids come in and you can't do 10 miles. The, the prices are up, you can only do eight, let's, let's say. You have to go back to, your, you, back to your governing body and go through, you know, what are you gonna cut, yada, yada, yada. And someone call, but so you cancel the, the uh, bids and you're gonna have to start over again at a future time. A citizen calls you and says, why, are, why were the bids canceled? You can't tell them that. Is that what you're saying? You can't tell them that scenario that I just that I just said 
the we couldn't afford it. We had a is that what you're saying? I would say, I think in in part, yes. I think if if the if the answer was, um, the bids all exceeded available funding, mm -hmm. that's not getting into the specific financial particulars of a specific response. Uh, which again, which is in section one, clearly states that right. you can't give out specific bid responses. Right. Right. But if you were just going to simply respond to that citizen and say, well, we canceled it because we didn't have enough money, I think that would be, right now, what you would get is, I can't tell you anything. Right. So you couldn't tell them that. Yes. That's what I'm, that, oh, <laughs> pardon me for following up without, per, uh, so, okay. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, under, I understand that it is a problem. Okay. Commissioner Chair Chella. Madam Chair and members of the committee, I actually wanted to speak on. Uh, I, I oh, understood there was case, a, uh, Yeah. In that case, we'll call, we'll introduce the amendment Thank first. You. Okay. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak on House Bill 284, not the amendment? Okay, in that case, I will call Representative Schuett to present amendment number 320H. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, I am Representative Diane Schuett. Uh, I represent the town of Pembroke, Merrimack 12. And I'm also uh, chair of the Merrimack County delegation. Um, this amendment, number 0320H, I believe you all have copies, is a non germane amendment that does not change any language in the original House Bill 284, but simply would add to it. This language originally went to another committee in the House as House Bill 148, which voted it inexpedient to legislate based not on the content, but rather simply because the sponsor was unable to present, introduce it, and speak to it. We were able to get that bill laid on the table when it came before the House so that the language could be brought forward again. That is the amendment you see before you. It basically enables all 10 counties to avoid requesting bids on items or services under $10,000. There are several others here who can explain the reasoning behind it, uh, the time and costs this would save our counties and our taxpayers, and probably answer any questions you may have on the process or the language. Um, thank you. Are there any questions? Representative Gould? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for taking my question, Representative Schuett. So am I correct in understanding that this replacement, I'm not seeing anything in here that changes the nature of the information that would get released that was in the original bill we talked about? This, this amendment would not change anything in 284. Okay. It just adds the contents of House Bill 148 to it. Okay. And to, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's an add-on, not a replace-all. Right. A, a friendly amendment, I would say. Right. Okay. Representative Gerhardt. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think we spoke about this earlier at the county delegation, but I'm just concerned about the transparency aspect of this. So if we're going from five to 10,000, is there any way to make all of these purchase, purchases that are in that zone that's changed, the five to $10,000 range, more publicly accessible instead of having to go through the 91A route? Or I'm just curious if that was in, ever entered your... Um, I would say to ask that question of the folks who are, the prime sponsor of 148 is here, and I would say right. he'd be better equipped to answer that. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, Representative Shewitt. Representative Edwards. <clears throat> uh, 
Yeah, hi. Uh, for the record, I'm Representative Jess Edwards representing Rocky M. District 31, Auburn, Chester, Sandown, excuse me, Candia, and uh, Deerfield redistricting. I still haven't rewound my tape yet. I, uh, all four towns are in uh, Rockingham County. Uh, I'm the prime sponsor of HB 148. Um, I, um, I, I, I screwed up. I failed to show up at the introduction briefing or uh, hearing for 148. So it was a good bill then. It's a good bill now. It has a tremendous amount of support uh, because I didn't show up. Uh, the, the chair's position was to recommend ITL. And it's too good of a bill to let that happen to it. So um, one thing that Representative Shewitt did not mention is just how gracious she's been to step in to uh, an area where I where I clearly screwed up, and um, and in, and has stepped up and done the right thing for the counties. And I just think that's great teamwork. It's a good bill. Uh, we've got. Um, um, the commissioner here from Rockingham to talk about it to your issue on transparency representative I, I you know our the counties are very transparent in general on the budget and as I think about the county budgets I've seen and the lists of acquisitions I've seen I don't I don't know where this new range of of purchases between the the new ones five to ten thousand I don't know where those would show up but but what we're so that's a that's a fair question, and I and the reason we're raising it is because this this has not been raised since 1998. That's when the five thousand dollars went into effect, and so if you go look at the inflation scale, uh, five thousand in 1998 is about nine thousand now. So I picked ten thousand uh, dollars because that's what the counties told me they wanted, <laughs> but but it but it actually works out. So with that, um, I'd take questions if there are any. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks. Seeing none, thank you. Commissioner Chirichello. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. It's, uh, it's nice to be back at the State House. I, I was in your seats for a while, for 10 years, from 2010 to 2020. I see some familiar faces and some new faces, but... Uh, uh, I appreciate being able to address the committee. Um, as Representative Edwards had mentioned, the 5,000 number was basically in 1998, and if you do the inflationary um, costs, it basically was like, 90, it comes out to 92, so we just rounded it to 10. Uh, and I just wanna give you an example of um, why this would be beneficial for the county. So in my county, in Rockingham County, we we actually have an outside vendor that does all of the the food service. Uh, and they also take care of all of our meals for wheels for Rockingham County, which is there's a, they produce a lot of meals. We had an issue with uh, a piece of kitchen equipment that was over $5,000. Now, we knew where we could get the equipment, but according to the law, I have to put out the bid. So we basically were down with equipment for th three, three or four days. That kind of put a little bit of a, a crinkle on that. That's how this came to be. And we looked at it and we said, well, 5,000 really doesn't get, it's really not much now. So um, we're asking, I mean, it's as simple as that. We're asking to, to go to 10. Um, there's, there's nothing else um, really to be said, but, but just that. So it just gives us a little bit more wiggle room. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you. Representative Grota has a question. And it's not specific, well, it's specific to Rockingham. So in the amendment that Representative Shewitt um, submitted, there's a specific clause in RSA, uh, it's 28-E, that refers to Hillsborough, and there's a specific clause that, that refers to Rockingham. Yes. But that's not in this amendment. So is that, are you thinking that the top of it is going to, it's actually 28 colon 8F. Mm-hmm. I don't see that in the amendment. It's on line nine, repealed. Yeah. I am so sorry. No, that's okay. Thank that's you. Okay. Yep, Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. So the, I'd like to ask on that. Absolutely. That Rockingham County at one time had a unique bidding process, but if we make this change, you'll use the same as nine of, as eight other counties. Yes, um, my understanding is, is as we discuss as counties collectively, we we always discuss things together, um, and uh, it, it basically um, 
would help them as well. So that's where that came to be. Um, and then that, of course, the carve out for Hillsborough County because it's specific in the, in the language, in the, uh, in the law. So this would include all, all counties, all 10 counties. Except Hillsborough. Um, well, you've got Hillsborough on the bottom, correct? Am I yes. Afraid? Yes. Yeah. And the rest of them are in the, uh, the, the rest the of them, main, right? The exactly, area. exactly. That's that we have to word it that way because Hillsboro it has its own section, and they and they wanted they also wanted the the benefit of the tenth. I mean, obviously Hillsboro County being the largest. They I'm glad we will ha hear from Hillsboro County yes, later, so they yes. can explain why they need their own special piece of statute. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, uh, Ross Cunningham. Just. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. I'm Ross Cunningham. Um, I am the County Administrator for Merrimack County. Um, 34 plus years in government service, hence my hair loss. So good afternoon to all of you. Um, I'd like to give you a kind of a brief reason why Merrimack County is supportive of this change for many reasons. And I can give you a snapshot in 2022, just in the bracket of the 5,000, we did 37 formal bids in that bracket. And on average, every one of those bid packets, because we have a central purchasing process, it's about 20 to 30 staff hours it takes to process each one of those. So you can imagine the tasking it takes to do that work and do it in an open, transparent way. Um, and I think what I would say to you is if it changes from five to $10,000, the reality doesn't change for us of how a process is processed. The fact of the matter, it's the tasking involved with the inflation and the other arguments that were given to you earlier. Um, I can tell you that um, it is awful taxing at times. I've worked in two counties, both Sullivan and, and, and Merrimack, and they are at times can be problematic in a, in a situation where you have a down piece of equipment or you're pursuing uh, a service, um, and those things are complicated in this world we're trying to work in today post-COVID. Other than that, I didn't really have any other testimony other than to tell you I am in support of it and um, if you had any questions of myself. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. So, may... I confirmed that you said that in one year you had 37 RFPs in this price range? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. And the average time is 20 to 30 hours that we manage that. Ah, oh, 20 to 30 staff hours, okay. Excuse me, 20 to 30 hours of staff time to process each one. Okay. Which gets numbered and we score and then they're presented to the Board of Commissioners for final authorization. That's the rest of the story as they unfold. Okay. Of course. All right, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, David Ross. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is David Ross, and I am the administrator of Hillsborough County Nursing Home. Um, I do stand here in support of um, the amended House Bill 284 to increase that threshold from $5,000 to $10,000. We are finding that so many products now are included at that $5,000 level and is rapidly increasing the number of RPs that we're having to do for products that are insignificant to business operations, such as styrofoam cups, um, for example. Um, and as Mr. Cunningham shared, the um, RFP process is extremely labor intensive for us, but it's also time intensive in that the time it takes to prepare the RFP for vendors to be able to review and submit a proposal for us to be able to make the bid award um, and to um, procure the products, it delays business operations for now at that $5,000 level for so many products that really are insignificant. Um, back in 1998, when this level was set, um, since then, um, the price of household paper goods, according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, has increased 125%. Um, and we are definitely seeing that at our end. Um, so we just ask that we um, that you approve that so that we can 
um, focus our energy where it really belongs on business operations and on products that are of substantial significance to business operations. It does not increase the amount of money that can be spent. It doesn't have any impact on budgets. It does not um, change our responsibility to be um, stewards um, and have our fight or our fiduciary responsibility. Hillsborough County does have a separate statute here um, that um, dictates what the requirements are for competitive bidding and what the analysis um, is for bid award. Um, and we are not asking for that to change. Um, that does help us very much to ensure a consistent and thorough process. Um, and we are all very satisfied with that. Um, and the other counties are satisfied with their process and we appreciate your consideration of that. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Kate Horrigan. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Kate Horgan. I represent the New Hampshire Association of Counties. Coming around, you will see a letter in support uh, from the association, as well as Merrimack County's written testimony, just so that you know that that is coming around. So you should take two, and here comes Hillsboroughs. Um, so we are in support of this legislation, and uh, can I just say ditto to what my members have stated? They did a great job explaining it. Um, it's it's merely an inflation thing for us. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions, but I think they did a great job explaining the bill. Okay. Are there any questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none. Thank, thank you. you very much. All right. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify on House Bill 284 or its amendment? Okay. Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. And right. and open the public hearing on House Bill 359. It's coming. <laughs> All right. Representative Reed, excellent. <clears throat> Madam Chair, were you recognizing me? Yes, I oh, did. Oh, I'm I sorry. Can't. I didn't I didn't quite hear. I apologize. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, honorable members of the committee. For the record, my name is Ellen Reed. I represent Rockingham 10, that is Newmarket and Newfields. And I am here to introduce HB 359, the effect of which it would be to establish a legal holiday for um, election day as well as uh, primary election days. So <clears throat> the main issue that I want to kind of bring up is one of voter turnout. Uh, Obviously, a self-governing body only works when people actually show up to self-govern on the days that we have these things we call elections. Um, New Hampshire is the fourth highest state in the country, and I say state because I'm about to go somewhere else with that, um, and yet our voter turnout is under 60% in, in a good year <clears throat> for most years. The United States in general, however, while we are fourth in the in the country for a state, the United States in general is 31st in the world. So as self-governing goes, we aren't doing that great a job of making sure that we are all actually making sure that all of our voices are being heard. Um, I brought up state specifically because we do have a place in the country um, that excels at voter turnout, and that is Puerto Rico. On the island of Puerto Rico, voter turnout in a uh, mid-off uh, uh, year is in the 80s percentages, and in a presidential year is in the 90s. So I'm, I'm kind of looking at those numbers enviously, even though we're fourth amongst states. Um, however, when Puerto Ricans move to the mainland, their voter turnout drops, even beneath regular voter turnout. So why is this? This is strange. Why, why is it that Puerto Ricans have such high, amazingly high voter turnout, high, high in, you know, even amongst world numbers, and yet 
um, drops to under 50% when they uh, come to the mainland. The Puerto Ricans have a holiday for their uh, election day. And there's two levels to this. So the first and most obvious I'll talk about first, and that is um, having a holiday obviously gives people the time to vote, specifically working people. It specifically gives people who otherwise might have to work or might not know when they have to work on election day. Um, and so not be able to even fill out an absentee ballot ahead of time, because as you know, our absentee ballots require an affidavit for one of four reasons. Um, and so if you don't know that you're going to have to work ahead of time, and then it turns out you do have to work, then you don't have the ability to fill out that absentee uh, ballot. Um, but then when you do work, and you know, just imagine your average American life, you have to take the kids to school, go to work, work all day, come back, pick the kids up. Maybe there's a soccer game, maybe there's a recital of some sort, make dinner. This is very difficult for people. The alternative is to have a day off where you can celebrate the entire day and have a specific time and everybody's time could be different, but work it in and then bring the children into that scenario so that they can learn what self-governance is all about, what small d democracy having a republic is indeed all about. So that's the time issue and that one is the obvious one and just so you're aware, the reason our uh, federal elections are on Tuesday, was um, the best effort by our founders. I, I, I teach American government at community college, or I have in, for, for several semesters. And they did that intentionally because this was a time when we didn't have such a thing as a nine to five office job. Everyone was a farmer. People were farmers and everyone went to church. So if everyone farms, but then everybody goes to church on Sunday, you take Sunday, you give people one day of travel because travel was slow back then, and then we held our elections on Tuesday. So the framers did their absolute best to have elections on a day that was, were the most accessible, was the most accessible for the most people. We should be duplicating that intent today to get as many people involved in voting as possible. And I would just add, with all of the kind of unrest and unhappiness that we see on both in both political spectrums with our government, government, that a lot of that can be addressed by making sure more people's voices are actually heard. People will not feel as unrepresented as they do by their government if more people have a say in that government. So that's the turnout piece, the, the actual time to turn out. But there's another reason that Puerto Rico um, and their election day holiday is so important. And that is it's not simply a day off. It is a holiday in the truest sense. They celebrate democracy. They celebrate the idea of self-governance, the, the fact that they get to have a say. And in, <laughs> the irony, of course, being that they get to have a say far less than we in the states do uh, in, the actu in an actual state. But they still celebrate it. They celebrate it with things they call caravanas, which are these parades. Um, and so I'm imagining for Election Day holiday, it's not simply a day off. I'm thinking of things like barbecues and parties and debates and mock elections and things that really, truly celebrate the idea that we get to have a say in our government which was truly radical for the time. And if you think about it as a holiday, any type of holiday approaches, you as a, a work, working person, you're aware, you're more aware of that day because it's a day that you have off. So it's marked on the calendar, it's coming up, you know that it's coming, you're starting to make plans with family, you're making plans with friends. So 4th of July, a day that we have to celebrate the creation of our country, the creation of our great experiment in self-governments. Memorial Day, a day that we celebrate the people who died for our democracy. Veterans Day, a day that we celebrate the people who fight for our democracy. President's Day, a day that we celebrate the people who have served our democracy. We have all of these days and more. Uh, Columbus Day, we can argue, is a day that is celebrating the discovery by Europeans of the new world, which led to us having our democracy and our great experiment in self-governance. So all of these days we have off to celebrate the idea of self-governance, but the day that we actually do the self-governance, we don't have off, does not make sense to me. 
So I think setting it aside as a day onto its own where we know it's coming up, we see it in the calendar, we know we have it off, um, will really help instill the civic discourse and the civic engagement we all believe we should have more of in this country. So I want to get into the bones of the bill. So the first paragraph is the existing paragraph on state holidays. And um, it turns out that election day is already in our list of state recognized holidays, which got me searching for why the heck is it the only day that of the list in the paragraph that we don't actually have off. Um, and it turns out that there was no actual definition for what this list meant. So there was a list in our RSAs of what state holidays were, the list of state holidays, but no description of what that actually meant, what happens on a state holiday. So I created that description and I described what currently happens on holidays, such as Christmas or Thanksgiving, Veterans Day, and all the days that I already listed, Washington's birthday, Independence Day, all of these are already listed. So essentially, I say that public offices, um, to the extent that they're not necessary, close down on that day. That includes schools. Many schools are already closed uh, on election day because those locations are polling places anyway. But, uh, but I am very clear to say, first of all, that if the governmental unit, be it a county, a, a, a municipality, what have you, decides that um, a function is necessary, then that obviously doesn't close. So we're not closing, for example, uh, police departments, fire departments, things of that nature. Um, we're also not closing anything that's required to run the elections, obviously, that goes without saying. And then finally, nothing in this would interfere with any particular uh, bargaining unit um, negotiating for a different day instead of they can negotiate whatever days they like. Um, so that only affects the public sector. The effect of this is essentially because we have a year without any election and then we'll have a year with a primary and a general. Um, so on average, you get one day a year. Um, the effect is one school day per year, one snow day per year, right? That is the equivalent which really doesn't have uh, a financial impact. You may argue it has a productivity impact because you're still paying people and they're getting a day off that, tends to, that is effectively paid except for the hourly workers. But I would argue a day where people are coming in late, leaving early or taking long lunch breaks in order to vote isn't a terribly productive day anyway and you're saving on overhead and hourly employees anyway. So I think it's a wash, which is probably why it does not have a fiscal note. Um, having said that, this touches uh, all everything I've gone through so far, does not touch the private sector whatsoever. Of course, we do not ever mandate that the, any private sector, any private company close. Um, so gas stations, restaurants, all of those things are already able to be open on days like Christmas anyway. I do say in the last paragraph that all employers shall, when practicable, allow employees up to three hours away from work, which would be unpaid, there's no requirement to pay them, to cast ballots in those elections. So the last thing I want to add, and this is only because in a year past when I introduced this, I had um, someone from the Teachers Association uh, speak in support, and that was a year that we dealt as the body with another issue that dealt with schools, and that is the concept of guns in schools versus guns at polling places. And he testified in favor of my bill because this solves that particular problem. Because if you don't have children present at the schools, then you don't have to worry about guns being at the schools while children are present, and you don't have to you know, worry about restricting the, the ability to carry guns. So I think I've touched on pretty much everything, so I'll, I'm happy to take questions. I, I would just like to say that I noticed you don't include the local elections. Yes, they, no, I do not matter. include, <laughs> they do matter, Madam Chair, and I, it, it would be extremely onerous to do that because every municipality has a different day of local elections. So if it was something that the committee did, you know, feel strongly about, I would absolutely support doing that. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Representative Reed? Madam Gerhard? Thank you, Madam Chair. The people that I know that don't vote, they're intentionally not voting because they don't believe there's any difference between the parties, especially at the federal level. 
So I don't know how this would really affect that. Um, and then, okay, so that's my comment on that. Thank right. you. Other qu it, any questions or no question. sign? <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Representative, for coming in and testifying. Um, my question for you is you gave a really beautiful description of what you would love this day to, to look like. Um, and it's, it certainly sounds like a great thing, but I'm not sure how your bill accomplishes that. Um, coming from a, a specific sector of um, society, we work through all of the holidays, all of them. Um, and as a part of the private sector, for us, a lot of times, these kind of things seem like we're paying for somebody else to have a day off and gain an advantage. Essentially, they've got more access to the polls than potentially we do. Um, what feedback would you give from that perspective? Um, thank you. I'm uh, I'm not sure what you mean by paying for other people. Um, because typically those positions are tax funded. Um, so if we're closing like town offices, state offices, those people are getting paid through tax dollars. Um, we typically pay those taxes. OK, all right. So um, while I do give the private sector three hours to go vote, so that's already an improvement for the private sector, if you're talking about like kind of broader culture stuff, so let, you can take Christmas Day, for example, almost all, but not all, private sector companies close on Christmas Day. Um, why is that? There's no mandate that they close. It's cultural. So. I think the first one, you know, not specifically with Christmas because it's been with us for a very long time, but in general, banks and other kind of like white collar jobs, those places tend to like follow the public holidays. And so they start to close. Then you would see more and more kind of businesses until you reached like, I doubt that a lot of retail would close or what have you. But it's it's a process because as more people start to have the day off, there's more demand for other people to have the day off to enjoy in the activities that that segment gets to enjoy in. So when you have a large percentage of having the day off, then you're gonna start to see events, concerts in the park, barbecues, fireworks, things like that. And so then there's more reason for those people to negotiate either privately or just kind of broader in the broader culture have those days off together. Follow up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just just as um, feedback to that, I suppose um, some some people, myself included, might feel that actually, as more people have that time off, it creates more work for certain sectors that are actually providing the services that everybody else is and is just, enjoying. Thank you. The, and and as I have in the bill, nothing. So as there's pressure, it also improves. So if you're in a sector that, for example, has a union you can negotiate and you have more leverage to negotiate to have a day off, even if that day has to be a different day. If you're in a sector that specifically needs to fill in when other people have the day off, you can negotiate for a separate day off. But at any rate, you will have three hours off. So it, in any, any way you slice this, it is still an improvement for the vast majority of people to have A, more access, but B, more cultural support. And I will just add as a comment to the previous comment that whilst it is true, and I would agree to a large extent with the people that you may associate with that, don't be able, that aren't able to turn out or don't turn out because they don't feel like they have a lot of choice and there are in fact reforms that can help, help with that significantly, that this is still a barrier for a lot of people and and a cultural barrier. And as we start to celebrate the idea of self-governance and civil discourse and discourse with people that we disagree with uh, oftentimes, but able to do so in a civil way and in a way that actually furthers our policy, that more and more people will start to feel like their votes actually matter. And maybe having more people makes the two parties listen to us more if more people vote. So that's what I would say to that. Thank you very, very much for your answer. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank oh. you very much, Representative. Representative Gallagher. Um, hi, I'm Representative Gallagher again. Um, so, yeah, I think Representative Reed did a pretty good job preventing, presenting the bill. Um, so I'll try not to repeat here and just keep it short, but I think it's a good idea. And I swear that I've had this idea independently before I'd ever heard of anyone pro seriously proposing legislation for it. So um, 
yeah, it's that's something I've been thinking about for a while. Um, I I definitely love election days. Um, you know, just the chance of going to the polls and seeing people I don't really see any other time of the year there. Um, it, it already is kind of like a holiday, and I think having some recognition from the government that for many people it is like a holiday would um, would would mean a lot to people. Um, so, yeah, uh, please support this bill, and I'll take any questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Uh, no, not today. Very good. Representative Newell. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you for the committee. I feel like everything that I was going to say was covered, so I guess I'm just going to keep this really short. Um, I'm not really sure what I can add, except uh, as a mom, specifically one who works seven days a week. Um, it, it, this just kind of seems like a no-brainer to me. If our goal is to accommodate robust and participate participatory elections with as much input from uh, as many people as possible, um, and there is such thing as a designated holiday, I think that this makes sense. This is what it should be. Um, yeah, I mean, that's basically what okay. everything else is Thank covered. you very much. Are there Thanks. any questions? No? Okay. Very good. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify on House Bill 359? All right, not seeing any. I will close the public hearing. Okay. Fine. All right, in that case, we are through with our day and there are no full committee activities for the next two weeks. I hope everyone will work on the bills we have already heard and go go to session. Thank you very much. And I'll just, uh, the notice is out. There's a licensing subcommittee meeting tomorrow at 10 o'clock.